Good morning. I would like to call the Monday, March 6th Board of Zoning Adjustments meeting to order. We will begin with roll call. Candace Forrest. Present. Todd James. Present. Tamara Agins. Present. Jose Alvarez is absent. Ramiro Diaz is absent. Alfonso Gonzalez is absent. Matt Rufo. Present. At this time, would the board make a motion to adopt the minutes from the February 6th meeting? So moved. Second. It's been moved by Commissioner James, second by Commissioner Eggins to adopt the minutes from our last meeting. Vote your screens. Just to clarify, um, just to flip the motion in a second. Yeah, horrible. Motion carries. Can't let you beat me to it. As a reminder to applicants, action that the board takes today will be released in the form of a disposition notice by March 16th and sent via email and mail to the applicant, as well as posted on the One Stop app for other interested parties. Request that the board votes to approve must show compliance with any noted provisos before the case is finalized and granted final approval. One item on today's agenda has been withdrawn. Item number one, BZA docket 001-23 for the property at 1734 Amelia Street has been withdrawn. We'll now begin with unfinished business. The property owner for item five, BZA docket 013-23 has requested that the board take up this appeal at the beginning of the meeting due to a funeral. Will the board consider a motion to suspend the rules to hear both unfinished business items for director of safety and permit decision appeals, item five and four out of order. Uh, so move. Second. It's been moved by Commissioner James, second by Commissioner Eggins to suspend the rules to hear items out of order. Vote your screens. And the motion carries. We will now begin with unfinished business for safety and permits decision appeals. Will the chair please read the hearing rules for decision appeals? Rules and procedures for public hearings, appeals of decisions of the director of the Department of Safety and Permits. The following procedures shall be observed during the appeal hearing. Each speaker shall give their name and address prior to speaking on the proposal. The representative of the Department of Safety and Permits shall present to the board the decision which is under appeal, the relevant code sections relating to the appeal, and any information explaining the department's decision. The applicant or representative will speak next. The presentation shall be limited to a maximum of five minutes for each applicant or representative speaker, but in no event shall the cumulative presentation total by applicants or their representatives exceed 15 minutes. Proponents or persons in favor of the proposal will speak next and be allowed three minutes per speaker. Opponents or persons in opposition of the proposal will speak next and be allowed three minutes per speaker. The applicant or representative will be allowed a rebuttal. The rebuttal shall be limited to a cumulative maximum of five minutes. Additional information. For an exceptional case, the time limitations may be extended by the presiding officer with the approval of the board. As the board deems necessary, the case may be acted upon at this meeting or deferred for additional information or review. If the case is deferred, it will be acted on at a subsequent meeting as provided by law. All proper parliamentary procedures shall be followed, including recognition of speakers, relevance of argument, and absolute prohibition of applause or demonstration. Standard of review. The Board of Zoning Adjustments has the power to hear and decide appeals where it is alleged there is an error in any order, requirement, decision, or determination made by an administrative officer in the enforcement of the Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance. The Board also has the power to hear and determine appeals from applicants who have been refused a building permit because of a violation or conflict with the Zoning Ordinance or the official map of the city. The applicant's appeal to the Board of Zoning Adjustments is governed by Section 5-408 of the City of New Orleans Home Rule Charter. 
We'll now begin with item five, docket number 013-23-1712 Washington Avenue. Good morning, my name is Nick Kendall. I'm the zoning administrator in the Department of Safety and Permits. Relative to 712 Washington Avenue, the applicant's appeal alleges an error in the decision of the director of the Department of Safety and Permits regarding the reissuance of permit number 22-033387 RNVS. The subject property, 712 Washington Avenue, is an existing two-family structure that is being renovated into a four-unit multifamily dwelling under the small multi or small affordable multifamily dwelling provisions in the CZO. The permit was first issued on April 5th, 2022. However, that permit was rescinded after it was discovered that the scope of the permit did not include previously un, uh, the previously unpermitted addition to the rear of the structure by the former owner. The current owner provided additional information to confirm compliance with the building code and CZO, specifically the rear yard setback and permeable open space, and the permit was reissued on November 14th, 2022. The reissuance of building permit 22-033387 RNBS is a subject of the appeal. The appellant raises a number of issues which will be addressed individually. First, based on the owner's proposed plans, the permeable open space is only 29.25%, which does not meet the 30% requirement. The zoning division staff calculated the permeable open space requirement based on the plan submitted by the by the applicant and calculated a permeable open space of 1,302 square feet or 35.2. Uh, percent of the lot area or 35.2 percent based on the lot area of 3,691 square feet. This complies with the minimum requirement of 30 uh, percent. The second issue, it does not meet uh, state fire marshal code uh, 1017213 and international building code 1010.1.5 through 1010.17, providing level landings outside the exterior doors that are within half an inch of the interior finished floor elevation. Uh, the State Fire Marshal's Life Safety Code and the International Building Code requirements do not relate to the Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance and are not under the jurisdiction of the Board of Zoning Adjustments. Third issue. Uh, conversion of two units to four units, remove parking spaces on the first floor, and now has zero parking spaces. With eight bedrooms, this could incur up to 16 vehicles without parking. There does not appear to have been any legal off-street parking spaces at this location. Furthermore, a small multifamily affordable dwelling is not provided to provide any off-street parking spaces, so this development is not required to provide any off-street parking and therefore complies with the parking requirements. Uh, the fourth issue, previous plan stated ADA accessibility, current plan say FHA accessibility. There are no notes or drawings uh, for a ramp for the newly raised foundation that has a step up from the entrance. No ramp even would be feasible because the step up is where the unit after the swing of the door. ADA and FHA accessibility is not a comprehensive zoning requirement. Therefore, this is not under the jurisdiction of the Board of Zoning Adjustments. Uh, the fifth issue, the owners disregarded HDLC guidelines replay, uh, related to replacing wood with wood and, and instead has used hardy. Pertains to the fascia at the front of the second floor overhang. Owner is not following his own drawings related to the fascia on the sides of the house and instead has installed lap siding all the way up to the drip edge. Owner has made changes to the stucco facade without HDLC approval. HDLC design guidelines are under the jurisdiction of the HDLC, so this is not something that is appealable to the Board of Zoning Adjustments. Uh, the sixth issue, multiple cost estimates still do not reflect the actual cost uh, by underpricing and omitting major items, which has reduced the permit costs, windows costs, 40,000, permit costs, 15,000, just one example of many. 
The overall construction cost and contract value is not reg regulated by the CZO, so this is not under the jurisdiction of the Board of Zoning Adjustments. Specific roof, uh, specific constructions at the rear balcony does not even show the second floor column, ceiling, or structure of the roof. The plans indicate that the rear balcony will be modified to require with a 15 feet rear yard setback. Based on those plans, the balcony will comply with the CZO requirements. Uh, the next issue, uh, the owner believes he can now market two parking spots in the uh, pervious driveway, which illegally blocks a sidewalk and rights of way. There's not one legal parking space for this property. The plans show that the area in front of the structure will be permeable gravel. There's no indication from the site plan that this area will be used as off-street parking. Off-street parking is prohibited in front of the front facade of the structure so that it is not in a permitted location. If this area is used as off-street parking, that would be a zoning violation that would be enforced by the zoning division. And the final issue raised uh, by the appellant, uh, the owner has failed to abide by the requirements of the street cup permit. Again, required signage is non-existent. Owner has demolished a sidewalk right-of-way and driveway from the front property line to property line and property line to street. Blocked off the sidewalk area from the pedestrians and failed to follow the street cut provisions. There's no demolition drawings for this work. There's no site plan for the work. For this work uh, will be done after the utilities are completed. Street cut permits and modifications to the sidewalk and right of way is under the jurisdiction of the Department of Public Works. This is not a CZO requirement that is under the jurisdiction of the Board of Zoning Adjustments. The department believes that the building permit was approved in accordance with the comprehensive zoning ordinance and for the reasons stated in, in this report, the department's decision should be upheld. And that concludes my presentation. Thanks. Thanks. Is the applicant present for BZA docket 013-23? Is there someone here for the applicant? Has the applicant been um, contacted staff to know that this is um, coming up earlier? And that was the one that requested. I can't hear you. The property owner requested it. So it wasn't the applicant, it was the property owner. So how should we proceed without the applicant making a presentation? Uh, was the applicant informed? Yeah, that's it, yeah. The applicant was informed for it to move on. Right. That is correct. Probably on here. Yeah, um, I was just going to ask maybe if uh, I was waiting here for uh, go ahead. Uh, staff. Perhaps if the property owner is willing, we can um, move on to the next item. And if the applicant appears before he has to leave, we can continue. Okay. Is there a way that the uh, the applicant, do we have contact information to maybe contact the applicant while we hear the next case? Do we need to make a motion to um, to defer this to the next item, after the next item? You can make a motion to table it, yes. Yeah, and so move. Second. It's been moved by Commissioner James, second by Commissioner Rufo to uh, table the item to hear it a little bit later. Uh, vote your screens.
motion carries. Are we hearing number four now? Yes. Uh, number four, docket 01123, 6072 Laurel Street. Good morning, board. My name is Ashley Becknell. I'm the chief zoning official for the Department of Safety and Permits. Relative to 6072 to 74 Laurel Street, the applicant's appeal alleges an error in the denial of permits 22-32608-SPMA and 22-32609-SPMA as communicated to the applicant on October 27, 2022 by Claire Cahallan, Special Events Administrator for the Department of Safety and Permits. Appellant also appeals any issuance of restrictions on future events to one event per half of the year or to two street closures per year. Street closure permits are not subject to the zoning appeals process set forth in CZO 4.8. According to the CZO, appeals may be filed concerning any decision of the Director of the Department of Safety and Permits on the following applications of this ordinance. The decision of the Director of the Department of Safety and Permits on zoning verifications, the decision of the Director of the Department of Safety and Permits on zoning ordinance interpretations, or the decision of the Director of the Department of Safety and Permits on permits issued under the Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance. Street closure permits are not issued under the CZO. Rather, allowance for street closures is regulated by Section 146.583 of the City Code, and therefore this matter does not fall within the purview of the VZA. Even if this matter is considered within this Board's purview, the decision being appealed was not made by the Director of the Department of Safety and Permits. Under 146.583, the temporary closure of streets for non-commercial purposes by individuals or organizations shall be allowed only after obtaining written approval from the district council member and issuance of a special permit by the director of the Department of Public Works, who is authorized to impose conditions upon the issuance thereof. While street closure permits are filed with the Department of Safety and Permits Special Event Administration through the One Stop, the department's role in this process is to route the application through its LAMA system to all relevant parties for their denial or approval and to communicate this to the applicant. Safety and Permits, through its representative Claire Cahallan, did communicate the decision to the denied the permits at issue and set future restrictions, but these decisions were not made by the department and cannot be made by the department under city code. The department recommends that the appellant reach out to the district council member and to the Department of Public Works. Thank you. Thank you. Is the applicant present for BZA docket 011-23? Morning. Uh, my name's Stephen Adams. I live at 6072-74 Laurel Street. 70118. Our objective here is to seek reconsideration and reversal of the two performances that were removed from our permission to, to proceed. Uh, we find it unreasonable that this was declined. Uh, we're requesting that the proper department be directed to work with us and to arrive at a schedule for more in line of what the majority of the community as a whole would prefer to have, and that's to permit eight to 10 events annually. Um, just a little bit of history on me. Uh, I grew up in the neighborhood. I was spent most of my life on Webster Street and then eventually moved on to Laurel Street in 2005. Uh, I've owned my house since Katrina and have been a, a major part of my neighborhood in growing my community um, or our community uh, to try and gather for social events and just be able to discuss neighborhood events. <clears throat> As a result of where we've arrived here, we decided that we wanted to canvas the neighborhood and outreach beyond the complaint letters that we've had, which I believe is four or five in total, um, which I think tallies up to four people. Uh, through the course of canvassing, we basically reached out to 200 plus residents, all bounding blocks of the corner of Laurel and Webster. Um, we received almost 50% of those back in a short period of time. Uh, the general consensus is that everybody was in favor of continuing with these events. Um, as much as we'd like to have more than less, we certainly would be um, 
willing to to try and negotiate how many events we actually could have. Uh, I think the general consensus was between 10 and 12. We would be happy with eight a year, four in the fall and four in the spring. The attachments that we had with the canvassing and the surveys, um, we also encourage neighbors to write letters in support or if you did not support, we personally did not receive any letters of um, not supporting the cause. This is over 30 letters that came from um, immediate neighbors within a two block radius of the neighborhood. Some of the complaints that we had received from uh, the neighbors via the city was lack of parking, um, too loud, um, people coming from other neighborhoods, street closures, portalettes, and then police presence. I find all of these to be um, not true in regards to um, crowd control. We, we went ahead and, and tried to follow the proper chains of command where we filed for permits, we were granted permits, we were asked to get police details, we got police details, we were asked to remove the portalette, we removed the portalette after each show trying to appease everybody and, and stay between the, the buoys, if you will. Um, the sense of community that comes out of these community events, call them music events because they are, they surround by music, but it brings neighbors together. It allows people who didn't know each other from different sides of the blocks to actually get to know each other. For those who don't wish to attend, we respect that. Um, and we, we respect other people's property as well. Uh, what we're asking for cumulatively is less than 50 hours a year, eight weekends out of the year, four in the fall and four in the spring. I don't think it's an unreasonable request. Um, and I don't know that I'm even in the same, the right spot to be arguing this, honestly. I mean, given what you all preceded this hearing, my case with, if this is not the location that we need to be, where do we need to be? We've attempted to engage Councilman Jeruso. Um, we've had back and forth with emails. As far as I can understand, the buck stops with him. And correct me if I'm wrong. I'd like to know what is the resolve that we can have to try and proceed to get some headway moving forward and, and continue these positive events. Is that the end of your comments? Um, yes, that is. It's, I, I'll, I'll finish with one thing, uh, and then Casey Lipscomb is going to follow me. Um, just contrary to some of the, and I don't know if you all have read any of the emails, both in support and against, um, us being uh, an organization that is trying to raise money for ourselves, by no means are we raising money for ourselves. We raise money for musicians in order to play. Uh, we're a 501c3 organization. You know, that we're selling t-shirts to, to make money is not true. This is just something that's fulfillment for the neighborhood and it pays, helps to pay for the bands. Uh, I'm gonna close with that. I'm gonna defer to Casey Lipscomb, who's gonna expand a little bit more uh, on surveys and legal. If you could please keep your applause down. Thank you. Uh, you give your name and address for the record. Uh, this is Casey Lipscomb, 5926 Constant Street. Let's talk a little closer into the mic. Got it. Casey Lipscomb, 5926 Constant Street, zip 70115. Um, just to follow on a couple of comments uh, from Stephen and from the representative from Safety and Permits, uh, we understand the procedural question that's been raised by Safety and Permits. The decision on street closures uh, administered by the Safety and Permits Department uh, and approved by the district councilman or, or denied by the district councilman in public works, the request that the Safety and Permits Department has made is that we return to the same place that made the decision on the restrictions in order to appeal that decision. 
Um, that doesn't seem like appropriate due process for our discussion of the reasons why those two bodies made the restriction that they, they had. And if the safety and permits view of the authority of the BZA on this matter is correct, there is no other appealable uh, route for a decision on a street closure made by a council member and the Department of Public Works. Uh, if that were the case, then the only remaining avenue for potential relief on this matter would be civil litigation. And so we have pursued this as in front of the Board of Zoning Adjustments uh, as a result of the decision from the safety and permits that was issued by them. Um, just to speak lastly on the survey, you know, we did, we had in mind the complaints that were received about these, these cases, and we asked specifically in the survey, you know, a couple of questions. One, do you find this no, uh, live music on a Saturday afternoon disruptive to your home life? 77 out of the 79 respondents said no. Um, asked, is your parking negatively accessed negatively affected by a community event like this? 76 out of the 79 respondents said no. And 70 of those um, individuals said that they travel to these events by, by walking. Um, and we also, given the decision that we were issued, asked very specifically the question, how many street closures are reasonable and appropriate for this neighborhood during the course of a year? People could choose between two, four, eight, and 12. Um, the 70 of those respondents chose either eight or 12. The most responses were for 12 at 56, and there were no respondents who indicated that zero, sorry, that two was appropriate for the neighborhood. And so this information reflected in the 79 surveys uh, is more information that we can tell was considered by the district council member and the public works department in their consideration of the of the matter. Um, we have requested public records information related to this matter and received some information. Um, as far as we can tell, this review of the serve of the neighborhood is the most comprehensive data on this subject matter um, that has been reviewed. And so we do feel like it is a true expression of the neighborhood and what they think is reasonable and appropriate. Um, and so we, again, would ask a clarification on what the appropriate venue uh, is for this sort of appeal if the Board of Zoning Adjustments is not the appropriate venue. And we would ask for a removal of the restriction that was issued regarding two events a year, one every half year. Thank you. Anyone else here in support of the applicant that wishes to speak? You'd have to come up to the mic if you wish to speak. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Brian Allborn. Uh, along with my wife, Leslie Lee, we live at 5956 Annunciation Street. Um, since uh, late 2021, and that's in zip code 70115. Um, I wanted to speak because we had a, a personal experience with Laurel Street Music that led us um, to literally buy a home in the in the neighborhood. Um, my wife and I raised our kids in Detroit, uh, and over the last few years, we started coming to New Orleans, largely based on Jazz Fest uh, experiences. During one of our visits a couple of years ago, we got invited to attend a Laurel Street Music event where Sun Pai was playing along with someone else I can't remember before that. And we went to an event on the street where there was a band on Steve's porch. There were people with folding chairs. There was a porta potty or a pot of gold. And um, we were just enthralled with A, the performance of Sun Pai, who we'd never seen before. Secondly, um, the, the neighborhood and the esprit de corps of the neighborhood, all of whom, you know, seemed so friendly together. And Leslie and I said to each other, like, wow, because we were considering, like, where are we going to go live next? You know, our, our kids are out of school and what's next for us in life? And we said, this is something unique and special. And we've lived in Detroit. We've lived in Pittsburgh. We've lived in Philadelphia, New York City, lived abroad. What happens at Laurel Street uh, when these concerts happen is really unique unique to us and uh we we stopped our life's plans moved over to this 
and it would be a shame if it can't continue on because it's really special and uh, i hope everyone here could come with to one one day thank you for letting me speak thank you hi uh, my name is Laurie Frank. I live at 6022 Patton. And our experience was a little bit different than what Brian was just saying. We had moved here and it was one of the first days in our new home. And someone was walking by and told us there was going to be a concert on Laurel Street. And we went figuring we'd have a nice evening and listen to some music. And it was so much more than that. There was this incredible sense of community. Everyone was having a great time. I saw families with infants, children, teens, multi-generational, 20-somethings to 100-somethings. And everybody was there enjoying the music and enjoying one another. We felt so lucky that we had moved into such a family-oriented, caring, and inclusive community. We felt so strongly about it that we decided we wanted to help in any way we could. So we started volunteering for Laurel Street Music and have donated countless hours to helping the organization bring music to the community and in some ways, more importantly, the community to one another. Um, the concerts also provided a benefit to us. It helped us meet people, meet our neighbors, make friends. And we were really disappointed when they were shut down and limited. And we still see everybody, but not as often. And we miss the music, but it's more than that. We miss the community, the simple act of joining together with others for enjoyment and the bonds that form as a result of those shared experiences. When this hearing was delayed, I helped pass out notices to let everyone know so that no one would need to make an unneeded trip down here. Um, when Laurel Street Music decided to look at and reach out to the community and do a survey, I helped develop and pass out the surveys in the surrounding community so we could get good feedback on what everyone wanted. I donated my time doing this because that's what you do when you live in a community. You care about your neighbors. You support your neighbors, you help your neighbors, you listen to your neighbors, and you make opportunities to join with your neighbors. We live in a world where we have lost touch with one another. Numbers bring anonymity. Anonymity makes it easier to not care for one another, to be disrespectful to one another, to ignore one another. Laurel Street Music concerts are a great benefit to the community. They offer a new, unique opportunity for community engagement and building bonds within families and between neighbors through the enjoyment of music, New friendships are formed, old ones are rekindled, existing ones are strengthened, and community bonds are forged. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else here in support of the applicant? Good morning. Uh, my name is Ernest Stenson, and I live at 6071 Laurel Street, which is directly across the street from where Steve lives, where the concerts take place. And um, I got involved early as my wife did, uh, Donna, and we have done different things to try to get to, to know our neighbors. But the thing that surprisingly to me, after having lived there for many years, has helped us meet more people and get to know them better have been these concerts. And I guess it kind of makes sense you know, once you realize why, but it wasn't something we expected. We were just trying to support musicians. And what we discovered was lots of neighbors came uh, to the concerts, they met each other, they met us, we learned more about them. And I could go on and on, but I'll just give you one concrete example because I think this says a lot. So I was the one who had sent out the emails because I collected emails, I know how to do this. And I figured that would be a, an easy way to let everybody know when concerts were happening or got canceled. Because I'm the one who sent out the emails, everybody had my email address. And when Hurricane Ida happened, people who were out of town who couldn't check on their houses, a couple of them emailed me and said, hey, Ernie, would you mind checking on my house? Um, I said, sure, fine. And I did. So, you know, it was things like that that gave me an epiphany that having these concerts became the vehicle through which we got to know each other better. So I don't know if this is the right procedural venue. I, I, I understand some people object, but I'd say that we are we have tried to be as accommodating as we understood how, and we will continue to do that. So um, I hope this is the right venue. I hope you take that into consideration. And I do think that more than two concerts per year would be beneficial to the company, to the, uh, the community. Thank you. Thank you. Is anyone else here in support of the applicant? Good morning. My name is Craig Ball. I live at 
3251 Laurel Street, zip code 70115. I wanted to add a little background because I know you're not here sitting to decide if this is good or bad. You've heard all the good, and there's much more that could be said about the good. But a little background about what it is that we are talking about. We are talking about neighborhood porch concerts here. They began in pandemic as an effort to try to help struggling musicians, and they did that. And we're not talking about arena concerts. We're talking about small groups of musicians playing on Steve Adams' porch, and we sit, most of us, across the street in Ernie and Donna's driveway. That's the scale that was intended. That's the scale that has been characterized by these events for most of their life. But let me say that in all candor, we became, in a sense, the victim of offering something that was so irresistibly joyful and positive, such a uniquely New Orleans experience, live music in your neighborhood that you could meet with your friends and neighbors, bring your children and your dogs, that we were sometimes found ourselves entertaining more people than we expected. And as we struggled to try to make it safe to work with the city, it grew in ways that we didn't intend. There were concerns raised about public safety. So it was suggested that we close the street. So we made applications to close the street per the process. That meant bringing on police details. So we raised the money to do police details. And so it grew in a way that we didn't really intend. And as we've struggled to try to make it safe to make sure that we don't transgress any ordinance of this city, but more importantly, that we show warmth and kindness and respect for our neighbors. And I, I wanna say for my small role in this, that I apologize. I apologize to you, Ms. Monroe, and any other neighbor who is here, who has been inconvenienced or has had a moment's concern as we have struggled to make this a positive community event uh, and we, as I want to say, just as you heard from Mr. Svensson a moment ago, we are committed to that. We will get permits and we will close the street or seek to if that's what makes it the best possible thing for the neighborhood. You are being told you don't have authority over a street closure. We only sought a street closure because that's what we were told was the best thing for the neighborhood. We are being told that we must seek due process by appealing this not to you, but back to the same person who makes the decision. How can it be due process if we are sent back to the decision maker each time? So I just want to close by saying that when you go out and you give a bottle of cold water to the people who pick up the garbage, or you go and take care of the litter around the public street, or you give $5 to Noma, you're a philanthropist. My philanthropy is supporting Laurel Street Music. All of us are here, over here, Thank because we want it to Thank continue. You. Thank you. That's Thank the you. end of your time. Thank you. Anyone else here in support of the applicant for BZA docket 011-23? Hello, can you hear me? My name is Amelia Leonardi and I live at 406 State Street, 70118, which is in that same block as the concerts are held, considering the square. I wanna speak for a moment about a different aspect, advantage of having these concerts. Um, I serve as president of our board of the West Riverside Area Patrol. Um, that is a, our security for our neighborhood. Um, it's been in different names, but close to 20 years. We are not a taxed security district. We, we pay our policemen, but we are a volunteer organization. So what that means is the more members we have that pay dues, the more money we have, the more money we have, the more hours and shifts we can have policemen in our area. Um, so 
I will say, I can't tell you the number of members I have, we have recruited through these community events, but it has been significant. Um, so it has really helped and is helpful in recruiting new members who don't know about our neighborhood security, which is, I believe, significantly helped with our safety. The other aspect, of course, that's maybe been alluded to is in our society now, we don't always know our neighbors. We go in and out. So again, in addition to all the fun we have enjoying the music, it's helpful to know your neighbors so you can look out for each other, as we all know. So thank you. Thank you. Anyone else here in support of the applicant for BZA docket 011-23? You could come up, please. Yes, <clears throat> my name is Andrew Palmer. I live at 59. Maybe to pull it up a little bit. Annunciation Street, Andrew Palmer. Um, I'm a retired home inspector, former city employee. And uh, when I moved to the neighborhood in 1989, uh, we enjoyed it for its community, its quietness. Unfortunately, we've had some problems with trains quite often. <laughs> we've had some problems with helicopters more often, but we do not have a problem with music. Music does not occur as often as the helicopters and the trains. And I might say that now at my age, I don't get out as much to hear the music as I used to. The clubs start at a late hour, it's hard to park, sometimes crime is an issue. But about six or eight times a year, it's quite quite enjoyable to find in my neighborhood, I can go two or three blocks and find musicians that I otherwise would not hear at 10 or 11 o'clock at night, right behind me around one in the afternoon. These concerts are perhaps two, maybe three hours, I don't know, but it's enough, enough time for us to set up a chair and greet some neighbors and hear some music. And I don't know if any musicians are here or not, but I greatly support music in New Orleans, the culture of New Orleans, and bringing these musicians to the people rather than to venues we cannot or will not go to is really a pleasure. So please um, consider these remarks and the remarks of my neighbors, and let's continue the concerts. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else here in support of the applicant for BZA docket 011-23? Anyone here in opposition? You can pull the mic down. Hello, my name is Marie Monroe and I live at 6105 Laurel Street, right in the heart of where all this occurs. Everybody has glossed over from the very beginning some of those complaints that we had. Mr. Adams, who is the self-proclaimed mayor of Laurel Street, applied for porch concerts. And those restrictions are listed, what they can and what they will not do. They cannot dance in the street. They have to have chairs. They have to listen. They have to be seated. Every one of those things were violated. Now, what we also don't say is this is we want to help musicians. Everybody wanted to help the musicians, but that has passed. Now it's changed. They have a website that they advertise all over the place. It's not just the neighborhood. I recently talked to someone who just bought a house, is renovating it, and they said, oh, this is just a neighborhood thing. Oh, no, it's not. They have a lot more going on. Mr. Adams, as of Toth, has done exactly what he wanted to do, blocked the street, but this time they had an added thing, addition. They took the chairs from the restaurant, put it in the street, and sat people down to block the traffic. When we asked them to move so that the traffic, we had a complete blockage. No one could go down either street. Webster 
on Laurel Street, they had it completely blocked. There were people dancing in the street. There was a woman with a handicapped child. When we asked them to move, she just stood there. This goes on and on. And Mr. Adams is no stranger to breaking the law. He does what he wants to do every year. He goes and he sets off an illegal fireworks display at that very same corner. Now, I live in that neighborhood. I have been there many, many years. In fact, I think I'm the only one that actually still has a single shotgun house. I don't have any closets. I have all my fireplaces. I have a clothesline in the back. But I live there. I know it. I have seen what is going on. I have seen the people across the street who just got, who took advantage of this, getting this whatever tax break, a hundred year old front, pull a trailer in the back. I have seen the people on the very corner build a brand new house and list it with the assessors as a hundred year old home. This goes on and on. We have now people are expanding. They're trying to get groups in, they advertise. So this is a draw for them to get more people to come to the neighborhood. And I, I have a picture on my phone. Where I can show you where these people actually sat in the street after towed. They tell you, oh, this is for friends and neighbors. Well, let me ask you something. When I ask my neighbors to come, I don't make them go use a portalette. Okay, that's the end of your time, ma'am. Why do I just get... a? These people got up and they got to talk all that time. And I'm one person. I don't get any more than this. Um, the, the rules are that each speaker gets three minutes. If we have any additional questions, we can call you back up if we have any additional questions. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else here in opposition to BCA docket 011-23? The applicant has an opportunity to rebut. So just in response to Ms. Monroe's uh, comments that she had made uh, in regards to advertising the events, we do not do any public advertising on television, radio, any things of that nature. We have a website, which is true, which keeps all of our neighbors in the loop of the upcoming events, both for Laurel Street Music and any other type of events that are in the neighborhood. Um, if there were any postings on the radio, that may have been done by the individual who was performing. And sometimes they will post something to WWOZ. We don't encourage that. And since that has been done, we have asked that any musician who plays on the porch do not advertise publicly. Seating in the street in regards to Mardi Gras, um, I'll, I'll just point out that if all streets are blocked off during the parade. There's no traffic that can come in or out of the neighborhood due to the box that we are in. There, there's no ingress or regress to our location. Uh, yes, there were seats in the street. They were not provided by me, nor were they provided by the restaurant. They belong to the restaurant. And I don't know if they were employees and or other people in the neighborhood that just grabbed those to be able to sit down. In regards to me being an outlaw and I break the law and do whatever I want, I was reserved on the NOPD for eight years, and by no means am I intending to break the law ever. I've given community service, and all I want to do is to try and, and, and appease everybody in the neighborhood. And Ms. Monroe, I'm your neighbor. If you could keep your comments directly to us, please. Yes. Thank you. As far as Ms. Monroe goes, she's my neighbor. I've tried to extend the olive branch to her many times. I, I, I don't want to fight with my neighbors. And she is the only person that I am aware of that I've had confrontation with face to face. And I, I don't like it. I don't encourage it. And I hope that we can get some resolve. Thank you. Thank you. No, ma'am. If we, like I said, if we have any additional questions, we'll call you back up. Um, I think I, um, 
Ashley, I think you had brought up in the beginning. I was trying to remember whether it was you or Nick that made the original presentation. And um, I just want to get back to the question of whether or not this is um, appropriately before us. Um, because it was docketed, we needed to go through the process of having everyone give their comments. But um, to get back to that initial question, um, I think we probably should direct the question to, um, to our uh, legal, whether or not this is a matter that would be properly before us to consider. So um, as best as we understand, because it's uh, gone before um, safety and permits and we're in alignment with where they stand on this being uh, inappropriate for us, this is the place, this is not the place that they would be able to um, appeal. So I'm gonna, uh, if we wanna take a minute and I can see if they're uh, just speak with safety and permits sure. to see if there's another avenue for them to be able to have their concerns heard. And and we're happy to weigh in on that. As far as I'm aware, the there is no formal process for appeals from section 146.583. Um, but that's that's part of the city code. That's not part of the zoning ordinance. So there may be a provision that I'm not aware of. Okay. And when you say that it's not, um, there's not a formal appeal does that um, mean that the next level of recourse would be to take this matter to court? I'm not sure that I'm the best person to speak on that. Understood. Um, I, I will say that the zoning ordinance does speak to temporary outdoor entertainment events. That's not what was at issue here in my mm -hmm. understanding, but there is a limit of eight per year on those events in the zoning ordinance. That's 21.8.C.7. And in terms of this not being um, before us, is there any action that we need to take? Or um, I'm just trying to determine um, procedurally, how do we, since it's on our docket. I think that's a question for law. <laughs> Great. So because it's already docketed and we've heard everyone, um, the best process to move forward would be to make the decision, the determination, and then move to the next point of trying to find recourse in appealing if they find it best to CDC. Okay. Yeah, and I don't wanna get into kind of similar to Ashley, I don't want us to get into the point of suggesting what would be appropriate um, other than to just indicate that it's, it's not, not before appropriately us. before us. And then just whatever decision, whatever process we need to take on our end. If, we're, if you're saying we have to still take some type of action then we can just do that. Right, and also if this was, something that you guys wanted to potentially defer? Okay, well, I yeah. Me. I mean, I can't speak for the for the board. I think I'm, I'm just trying to understand if it's not proper, then we should just handle it in that regard. The fact that this, you know, take whatever steps um, to take it off of our um, Wait, agenda. Yeah. I guess my Any question, questions? Yeah, yeah, my question is just previously, I think we've either issued something to be moved because it's not within our jurisdiction, um, which would be how you want to interpret that, that decision. I, th I think that's what seems to be the most appropriate at this time, considering, I mean, staff has provided, oh, I'm sorry, Ashley, you've provided is the three points by which we're supposed to review these items. And everything that has at least been displayed is not something that falls within the CZO's purview. So to me, I believe that, I mean, this is more of a moot issue as opposed to anything else. And just maybe for those, the neighbors and residents to really consider the two options that was maybe provided within a staff report to reach back out to the district council member or to um, public works, because you, this is about street closure and not about a zoning ordinance related item. Any so, other questions, um, board members? I think previously, if we've rendered it moot, we haven't actually voted. Yeah, it's not us, so there's nothing for us to vote right. on. You could talk in, into, I'm sorry, just so we could hear. I was just asking if, 
if we don't take action to render it moot, how does it become moot? Well, and that was what I was, um, and we've only had a handful of times, so I don't always remember <laughs> procedurally how we've handled it. But that was kind of my my thought process is that I didn't remember what action would need to happen to get to the idea of it being rendered moot. I, I think if, um, if, if we just, I, just, I don't think it's our action though. Right. And I apologize for not uh, stepping in before uh, about uh, this issue being moot. If it's moot and you can't consider it, um, you can advise them of that uh, and issue um, have staff, you know, when they give the reasons, just indicate that in the reasons uh, and move forward that way. So I'll just, let me frame the question this way back to the law department. Would you concur that, th that this is a moot issue due yeah. to the? Yes. Okay. If, we're trying to work through our procedures here. So we're trying to work through our procedures to yell out from the audience is not the appropriate way to um, to seek any. If you have questions when we're done, you can talk with one of the staff members once we've resolved our um, process. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are we okay? Um, yeah. Ty is looking into it. Okay. Do we need a few minutes? Okay. Do we need to um, take a, a brief recess? Five minutes? Okay. Do we need to make a motion? <laughs> uh, motion for a five minute recess to allow the law department to confirm that we can actually hear this item. Second. It's been moved by Commissioner James, second by Commissioner Eggins to take a brief five minute recess. Uh, vote your screens. One person didn't vote. Motion carries. We will return at, I believe it's 11.08. Five minutes. We'll return at 11.13.
this I was given. Okay, we're going to get back started. So if we could um, get everybody either back to their seats or um, quieted down. Thank you. Will the board make a motion to return from recess? So moved. Second. It's been moved by Commissioner James, second by Commissioner Eggins to return from recess. Vote your screens. Motion carries and we're back from recess. I'll defer to the law department. Okay, so in regards to docket number BZA 01123, um, this item was inappropriately heard. It's not appropriate for BZA to consider um, the appeal that was brought before us. So we're going to um, refer you guys to go to the back and have a conversation. So we're gonna have to get the appropriate forum for you know, where you should be appealing this to, but this is not the appropriate place. And so they're not gonna be able to make a determination on what's before you. Um, and we understand this was previously deferred at your request. Um, so we're gonna have, if you follow him to the back, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So if we can move to the uh, the next item that had been uh, tabled, uh, BZA docket uh, 013-23, I believe. Yes. Um, the applicant, or yes, the applicant has requested a 30-day deferral as they could not be here in person today. And the property owner has said that they are fine with that as well. Do we need to acknowledge any speakers before we make any decision? In regards to BZA docket 013-23, is there anyone here in support of the applicant? Is it 003-23? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Is it 003-23, 1124 Louisiana or? No, this is 013-23, 712 Washington Avenue. Is there anyone here in support of the applicant? Anyone here in opposition? Any questions from the board? For motions in order. Proceed. Madam Chair, with regards to BZA docket number 013-23, my motion's for a 30-day deferral. Second. It's been moved by Commissioner James, second by Commissioner Eggins, to, uh, with regards to BZA docket 013-23, to defer the matter 30 days. Vote your screens. The motion carries. Next item. We will begin with the unfinished business for variances. Will the chair please read the hearing rules for variances? Yes. Rules and procedures for public hearings variance requests. The following procedures shall be observed during the hearing. Each speaker shall give their name and address prior to speaking on the proposal. The applicant or representative will speak first. The presentation shall be limited to a maximum of three minutes for each applicant or representative speaker. 
but in no event shall the cumulative presentation total by applicants or their representatives exceed 10 minutes. Proponents or persons in favor of the proposal will speak next and be allowed two minutes per speaker. Opponents or persons in opposition of the proposal will speak next and be allowed two minutes per speaker. The applicant or representative will be allowed a rebuttal. The rebuttal shall be limited to a cumulative maximum of three minutes. Additional information, for an exceptional case, the time limitations may be extended by the presiding officer with the approval of the board. As the board deems necessary, the case may be acted upon at this meeting or deferred for additional information or review. If the case is deferred, it will be acted on at a subsequent meeting as provided by law. All proper parliamentary procedures shall be followed, including recognition of speakers, relevance of argument, and absolute prohibition of applause or demonstration. Standard of review, the Board of Zoning Adjustments shall not authorize a variance from requirements of the Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance unless it finds, based upon the evidence presented to it, that each case has satisfied the nine criteria listed in Article 4, Section 4.6 of the Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance. Thank you. The unfinished business for variance item 1, BZA docket 00123 was withdrawn. The next item is item 2, docket 003-23 for the property at 1124 Louisiana Avenue. The applicant has requested a 30-day deferral and wishes to be heard at the April BZA meeting as they cannot be here in person. Okay. Is there anyone here in support of the applicant for BZA docket 003-23? Good morning. I'm Margaret Glass from the Stieg Law Firm. I'm here on behalf of the applicant. Can you hear me now? Uh -huh. uh, I'm here on behalf of the applicant. Mr. Michael Gray, the property owner and applicant, had a family matter out of town, and he is requesting a 30-day deferral. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else here in support of the applicant for BZA Docket 003-23? Anyone here in opposition? Any questions from the board? For motions in order? Yes, proceed. Madam Chair, at the request of the applicant, uh, my motion is for a 30-day deferral for BZA docket number 003-23. Second. With regards to BZA docket 003-23, it's been moved by Commissioner James, second by Commissioner Eggins, to defer the matter 30 days at the request of the applicant. Vote your screens. Motion carries. Next item. The next item is docket 004-23 for the property at 7808 Pearl Street. BCA docket 00423 is a request for variances from the provisions of the comprehensive zoning ordinance to permit the construction of a single family residence with insufficient front yard setback, insufficient front yard build to line, insufficient rear yard setback, excessive carport height, and a carport that encroaches into the required front yard. Staff is requesting a 30 day deferral in order to allow the applicant to provide additional plans. Is the applicant present for BCA docket 004-23? Is there anyone here in support of the applicant? Any opposition? Questions from the board? The motion's in order. Proceed. Madam Chair, regards to BZA docket number 004-23, my motion is for a 30-day deferral at, at the suggestion of staff. Second. With regard to BZA docket 004-23, it's been moved by Commissioner James, second by Commissioner Rufo to defer the matter 30 days. Vote your screens. The motion carries. Next item. We will now begin with new business for variances. The next item is item six, docket number 01423 for the property at 2435 through 2437 New Orleans Street. BZA 014-23 is a request for a waiver from Article 11, Section 11.3.8.1, Table 11-2A, and Article 21, Section 21.6.8.3 to allow for the debulking of a parcel resulting in insufficient interior side yard setback and excessive rear yard coverage. The site is currently developed as a two-family residential dwelling along the southern edge of the parcel on Lot 2, leaving majority of the parcel Lot 1 vacant towards the northern edge. The property currently features no off-street parking and is in the style of a traditional shotgun double. The applicant is 
proposing to debulk the property and obtain a separate municipal address for the existing structure on lot two. The applicant is not attempting to update the property through demolition or construction. However, due to the bulk and yard rec requirements outlined in the CZO and zoning interpretation memorandum Z-21-01, the separation of the two existing lots from a single tax parcel would create an insufficient interior side yard setback for lot two. The width and area dimensions of the subject parcel, parcel are substantially larger than many of the surrounding properties surveyed. Approximately 38% of those properties did not comply with the interior side yard requirement. Additionally, despite the fact that six out of eight of the surveyed sites contained accessory units in the rear yard, um, and they are compliant with this regulation, the subject site would be held to a different standard due to its current property tax status and size and denial would force the applicant to retain the two lots in a single outsized parcel. Staff finds the request for both waivers meets all nine criteria and therefore recommends approval of BZA docket 014-23, subject to four provisos. Thank you. Is the applicant present for BZA docket 014-23? If you could come up, please. You could give your name and address for the record. Sure. Um, John Cardinelli, uh, 3417 Iberville Street, New Orleans, Louisiana, 70119. Thank you. Did you have anything that you wish to add? No. Thank you. All right. Anyone else here in support of the applicant for BZA docket 014-23? Anyone here in opposition? Any questions from the board? For motions in order? Yes, proceed. Madam Chair, with regards to BZA docket number 014-23, my motion is to accept the staff's recommendation for the requested waiver of Article 11, Section 11.3A1, Table 11-A2 for interior side yard setback, and Article 21, Section 21.6A3, Accessory Structures and Uses, Rear Yard Coverage, uh, and move for approval, understanding that the nine criteria have been met uh, and acknowledge the four provisos. Second. Thank you. With regard to BZA docket 014-23, it's been moved by Commissioner James, second by Commissioner Eggins, to grant the requested waivers, finding that the nine criteria have been met and subject to four provisos. Vote your screens. The motion carries. Next item. Next item, item seven, docket 015-23 for the property at 2811 through 2813 Powhatan Street. BCA 015-23 is a request for variances from the provisions of Article 13, Section 13.3.8.1, Table 13-2, Article 21, Section 21.4.A, Table 21-1, and Article 22, Section 22.4.A, Table 22-1, to permit the construction of a single fam um, the construction of a second principal structure resulting in insufficient rear yard setback, more than one principal building on a lot, and insufficient off-street parking. Based on this report, the staff believes that the requested variances of Article 11, Article 13, excuse me. Section 13.3.8.1, Table 13-2, and Article 21, Section 21.4.A, Table 21-1, failed to meet criteria 1, 2, 4, 5, 6, and 7. Therefore, there are, I'm sorry, of the um, comprehensive zoning ordinance in that there are no special circumstances which are peculiar to the land, literal interpretation of the ordinance will not deprive the applicant of rights commonly enjoyed by other properties in the district. The variance will confer on the applicant special privileges. Granting the variance will alter the essential character of the locality. The property regulations will not result in a demonstrable hardship and the changes exclusively for the convenience and profit of the owner. However, the staff believes that the requested variance of Article 22, Section 22.4.A, Table 22-1, the off-street parking requirement meets all nine standards for variances of Article 4, Section 4.6.F, and therefore this, the staff recommends approval of the requested variance subject to three provisos. Is the applicant present for BZA docket 015-23? You could come up.
Good morning. Good morning. Patrice Poré. Uh, the property that I reside at is 10131 Flossmoor Drive, New Orleans, Louisiana, 70127. You can proceed with your comment. Okay. This property was purchased in January 21 from the city of New Orleans. Um, unbeknownst to me, I did not know that there were two individual structures on the lot um, because it was only the front unit was visible. It was two separate lots and that's how the property was built back in the um, early 1950s. Did all my research, um, put in the proper permit request and I was told that I could renovate the structures. But during the renovation project, we noticed that the second structure had nothing that was salvageable. So um, I came back to the permit section and they told me I needed to come over to you all to ask for a variance to rebuild the second structure. And as you can see from the photos, um, I left the structure as it was. Um, we did not touch it, waiting to hear from you all whether you would allow me to rebuild the structure. Of course, the structure would be rebuilt in the current guidelines. Um, that the city of New Orleans has for those. Um, so I'm asking that um, this committee approves the variances that are noted there and allow me to rebuild the structure and to replace the property back to put the property back in commerce as it was originally designed as a two structure um, property on one lot. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else here in support of the applicant for BZA docket 015-23? Anyone here in opposition? If you could come up, please. Good morning. My name is Charles Williams. I, I need to I pull the, the mic down a little bit. Uh, good morning. My name is Charles Williams. I own the property located at uh, 2819 Powhatan Street, uh, right just one house over from this particular structure. And I must say that I am, am uh, not in uh, favor of any variance uh, for this particular property and, and for various reasons. And what this particular uh, owner is planning on doing is putting two structures on a lot, which will create more people, more cars. And if you know this particular area, the street is very narrow. With more people comes more cars. And if this applicant has spent a little bit of time knocking on doors, talking to neighbors, she would have discovered that the neighbors don't like this, that sometimes the trash truck has to back out to go and serve the neighborhood. Sometimes the delivery trucks has to back out. And, on, on, and in the era of safety, um, anytime we put more cars on that curve, there's always uh, people flying around this curve where this house is located at. It, it could create a serious safety issue. So I oppose that. Not only do I oppose it for that reason, but right next to this house, uh, on the opposite side of this property, is a safe house for those women who are dealing with domestic issues, domestic violence issues. If this house is at the very end of the street, right near the train tracks, and you will see kids uh, enjoying themselves out there every now and then, uh, parents who are coming there, people who are escaping situations uh, uh, in domestic areas, in, in, in domestic situations. So I'm opposed of that uh, because any, uh, for that reason and for the reasons of the traffic that it can cause, more people, more cars. And I've seen cars flying through the neighborhood, through the area, and then not only that, the fire hydrant, sits right across uh, from this property where a car could park at and block if there's a major fire here. So again, if this applicant would spend just a little bit of time going around talking to the neighbors, they would have discovered as I did that the neighbors does not want anything other than just a single house on this property. Thank you for much for your time, thank you. Thank you, is there anyone else here in opposition to uh, BZA docket 015-23? The applicant has an opportunity to rebut. Um, that's the first time that I've heard that the neighbors uh, was actually had any issue with this property. The neighbors that I did speak with are happy to see that the property is being revitalized. Um, unbeknownst to me, I, I don't know about um, any of the property that would uh, cause any hazardous issues to the neighbors um, and the property next door. Um, that property being a safe house or any of that um, information was not given to, to myself or anyone else. But this property uh, would stay within my family. I don't have any intentions on selling this property. So um, the property would be used for that. And it is for my um, elderly parents and they only have one vehicle. So the structure in the back that we were looking to renovate was going to be an efficiency apartment. And I was not looking to add any additional parking to that structure. 
Um, and that concludes my comments at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Just a quick, quick, quick question to staff. And I think the applicant just brought this up. The intent was for it to be used as an efficiency unit, but historically, was this always two individual primary dwellings on this property? Yes. Um, yes, it was two um, dwellings on the property. I believe that it was constructed sometime in the around 1940, 1950, according to the Sanborn maps. Okay. The, the second concern that I'm seeing is also that from the survey as provided, it actually encroaches a foot beyond the actual property line, correct? It does. Yes, the um, existing structure does. And it's at the property line on both sides. On two sides? On both sides. Oh, all right. On Just want to make sure we're delineating where. It's on both um, side property lines and then. But it but it encroaches beyond the property line the on the property rear. Line at the rear, yes. So in any any configuration, even if it was supposed to be brought back, it's actually encroaching into a different property. So, so the um, if you look at what the um, applicant has submitted, they are it would be more compliant um, than what's there right now, as far as where the structure is, how the structure is developed on the lot. Um, they're proposing three feet um, for the rear yard setback and three feet for the side yard setbacks. So when you're saying more compliant, are they reducing the footprint? They're reducing the footprint, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So more compliant in that sense, yeah. And in order for that to happen, if the foundation has to be completely removed, so no matter what, it is a full demolition of this building, and then a new building is actually being built back in its place. Correct. In the staff report, um, we recommended, well, we suggested um, adding on to the rear of the existing structure, and that wouldn't create a rear yard setback condition or a rear yard setback deficient condition. I, 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 it's hard for me to hear you, Valor. Is that better? Yeah, go ahead. So in the staff report, um, we suggested that the property owner add on to the rear of the existing structure in the front, the front structure, um, to create the two family rather than um, rebuilding the rear structure, which would be um, a non-conforming condition in the neighborhood. Okay. So just a question to the applicant. Have you had a chance to review the staff report? I mean, in terms of what's been proposed, are you in support of what they're suggesting or are you asking for something different? Because I didn't we didn't you, you didn't necessarily present to that. Yes, the staff report was unclear because it looked like it was um asking to approve some of it, some of the variances, and then deny others. So I didn't know what that exactly meant and what that would look like. Okay. So maybe considering that, would you maybe entertain a deferral for a, for a month to work with staff to see what they've recommended and see if that is something that's more amenable to what you're trying to do for the development? Sure. Are there any other questions from board members? I was gonna ask, but you kind of went to what my questions were. <laughs> if a motion's in order. Yes, proceed. Madam Chair, regards to BZA docket 015-23, my motion's for a 30-day deferral to give the applicant time to talk with staff to under better understand the recommendation is currently proposed. Also suggest maybe just talk to your neighbors as well and just kind of get a just a broader context of what's going on and hopefully at least some of the comments that's provided here as well as what's in the staff report may help to give you better clarity as well as the neighbor. Second. Thank you. With regards to BZA docket 015-23, it's been moved by Commissioner James, second by Commissioner Rufo to defer the matter for 30 days. Vote your screens. The motion carries. Next item. Item 8, docket 016-23 for the property at 5621 St. Rock Avenue. This request is for variances from the provisions of Article 22, Section 22.8.8.1, 22 
one point B point I I articles 22 section 22 point 11 point a point one point B article 22 section 22 point 11 point D point one article 22 section 22 point 11 point D point two and article 22 section 22 point 11 point D point three of the comprehensive zoning ordinance to permit a two family residence with a parking space in a front yard and a parking pad with insufficient setback after the fact. So this applicant was cited by safety and permits for the non-compliant parking pad in April 22, and the applicant sought out a reasonable accommodation to remedy the issue. The request received a modified approval in July 22, subject to three provisos. So the executive director required a standard D restriction, which would benefit the disabled party at the residence, in addition to approving the request for front yard parking and a second curb cut, but denied the request for the insufficient parking, back, parking pad setback from the side lot line. So the applicant appealed this decision to the board in September 2022, and the application was ultimately denied. So the applicant has since applied for a variance to keep the parking pad in its current condition and to waive the requirement for a deed restriction. The staff would like to know that the to note that the CZO has been updated since the initial application. So now the parking pad setback requirement has changed from three feet to one feet. And now two family residences are allowed two curb cuts. Though this request is more compliant, staff recommends denial of each variant. So based on this report, staff believes that the requested variance for the front yard parking fails to meet criteria two, four, five, six, and seven, and that the literal interpretation of the ordinance will not deprive the applicants of rights commonly enjoyed by other properties in the district. The variance will confer on the applicant special privileges, granting the, the variance will alter the essential character of the locality. The regulations will not result in a demonstrable hardship. The change is for the convenience and property of the owner. In addition, the staff believes the request does not meets criteria one, six, and seven for parking pad design location, and that there are no special circumstances which are peculiar to the land. The property regulations will not result in a demonstrable hardship and a change is exclusively for the convenience and profit of the owner. The applicant, if you could give your name and address for the record. Joyce Lynn, Joyce Lynn Hayes, uh, 5621 St. Rock. You can go ahead with your comments. Okay. Of course, I would like to cut the one feet from the Mendez side and add it to the opposite side of the driveway. If I cut any more than that, you a car would be directly in front of the doorway, which would make it difficult to get in. Ask why do you need a driveway? Parking in the street is dangerous. Cars are vandalized or stolen. The, may, the mailman has complained about blocking the mailboxes. Sanitation has complained about going around the cars to empty the cans, and sometimes they don't empty it. A neighbor has complained about cars parking too close to her driveway, which is not correct. The tenant complained about carrying groceries and other other heavy items from the street to the front door, which makes it very difficult. Since I have gotten all of these complaints, I decide the only way for me to solve this is by adding a driveway. And I was told by two contractors that was doing front yard driveways that I did not need a permit. Since these were contractors and doing the same thing, I figured maybe they are correct and I did not get one. I deeply applaud, apologize for being misled. I am a single parent trying to support my sick son who, will, who has multiple incurable illnesses. In two years, I will be 80 years old. If I decide or if I have to get tenant that is a handicapped tenant to, so, uh, to live in my apartment, it may not happen because it's hard to find handicapped people 
who wants to just be live there by themselves or just live there. Um, I don't have the energy or the finance to deal with the driveway in the future. I would like for my tenant, my apartment to be for any tenant with a, without a handicap. It's too difficult to keep a handicapped tenant in the apartment. Is that the end of your comments, Ms. Hayes? I'm sorry. Is that the end of your comments? Yes, it is. Okay, thank you. Thank is there anyone else here in support of the applicant for BZA docket 016-23? Anyone here in opposition? You can come up, please. Good morning. My name's Jerome. James, I live next door, 5617 St. Rock, uh, New Orleans, Louisiana, 70122. Uh, if y'all look at the pictures, well, the problem that we have in next door, I'm the one who spent $1,500 to put that wooden fence there because I had issues with the new tenant that reside there now, parking in the driveway. And the issue we have it now, that the driveway is too close to, to my driveway to where when he parks there in, the tenants that come to visit them blocks the driveway. So that means when we come out, we got to go up a one-way street to get out because the street is too small. And uh, <clears throat> and the people that do come there, we're not going to do to get them to come with the vehicles from in front of the driveway, and that's an issue. So the people that we're dealing with that she have rent there, nobody there is ADA at all. <clears throat> and we've been on that house thus. Well, we had that house built in 2011, and we've been living there. The other house before that was, was in 2020, 2003. All the homeowners who had that house, we never had issues with, with the people until now. And uh, I'm afraid that something bad gonna happen between my house, that house, the tenant that lived there, because it's a big people that, that come there and visit that house. I'm not gonna move because it's what they want to do. Uh, so I'm asking the board uh, to grant us the, uh, the issue with that because the driveway is made ship anyway. That was a grassy area right there. And uh, Ms. Jersey, she just, you know, coming up with all these other excuses to keep the driveway there, and it's not right. Because we need three feet to turn out that driveway. It's a one-way street. And the way things are going, we're going to have an accident. Uh, going up a one-way street trying to get out get out the driveway. Now, for us with the garbage and, and all other kind of stuff, garbage do go on the street. We do put all, all the tenants put the garbage, I mean, residents put the garbage on the street. So nobody have issues with the garbage being uh, not empty. So that's not true. As far as the mailbox, my mailbox in the front of the house too, we don't have no issue with getting mail in the box. So I don't know what issues that they have there where they have not getting mail in there. Thank you. Is there anyone else here in opposition to the applicant for BZA docket 016-23? The applicant has an opportunity to rebut. He doesn't have an issue with his garbage can or the mailbox because he has so much land there and the whole front yard is parking. But the little space that the tenants do have there to park their cars is a problem because parking directly in the street with these cars and the mailman, the sanitation, I did give you some type of uh, indication about the mailman. He gave me a paper several times and said he was having a problem there. So I don't know, it's best to really try to get along with neighbors, undoubtedly, they don't know the second commandment of God is to love thy neighbor as thyself. And that's what I try to do. I, I don't even, I didn't even know he was the person. That's how much I really know about the neighbors. So I don't know. I just try to get along with everybody and do the right thing. I, I didn't have bought their garbage can in, although he don't know it. I bought his can in several times and uh, try to help out. It's just that you got to live right. The world is too corrupt. And I believe in 
having God on my side. So he's one person and I'm another. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Uh, just a quick question of staff. I just wanted to make sure um, with the parking, is it both of the, the parking spaces that are listed um, or is it? No, the, the second space is located next to um, the it. neighbor's house. So it's just the, um, the one looking at the photo to the, to the right. Yes. Hey, just a quick comment, Chairwoman. Um, just remember seeing this item come before us once before and also just within the staff report, it's called out that this has already been through special, uh, reasonable accommodations. And I think even at that time when we heard it last time, the recommendation was made then about how to, how to modify where this parking pad is provided. And what I understand is that just from what I'm seeing, this is just being asked again to not put the parking pad into compliance. And I think even back then we noted with the reasonable accommodation requests, in any configuration, if this was to get approved, this would have to then still be removed at a later date if the uh, the reasonable accommodation is still not required for the second unit. So I think it's, again, this is, I understand what she's presenting from her comments, but it, this is one of these items where it's here, it's something that is after the fact, but more importantly, there's another way to put this in to compliance and still meet the requirements at least meet what the requirements need were spelled out from the reasonable accommodation and also just to maintain some level of decorum of what's required for a parking pad. Yeah, I was gonna um, weigh in in the, the comments in the staff report, it indicated that the applicant didn't wish to proceed with a reasonable accommodation request, which is why this came before Back us. Right. But um, in terms of the the nine criteria, I I mean, going back to that and I just don't, even with the comments from today, as well as the staff report, I don't see where there's um, satisfaction of there being a hardship. Um, I, I'm not clear on, in looking at the, the photos, where there's not sufficient parking on the street to be able to, um, to account for whatever the concerns are around the mail delivery, as well as the trash pickup. There's sufficient area that that should be able to be met without, I mean, I can't see what's on the other side, but even in directly in front of the building, if you take away that additional parking space. So I don't see where there's establishment that there's a demonstrable hardship. Um, I mean, I don't know if any other uh, commissioners have any other thoughts or questions on that. Just from my position, I'll concur with your comment. It's just not seeing it. Are there any other questions from board members? For motions in order. Yes, proceed. Madam Chair, with regards to BZA docket number 016-23, my motion is to accept the staff's recommendation uh, for the requested waivers and move for denial, understanding that the nine criteria have not been met for these requests. Second. Thank you. With regard to BZA docket 016-23, it's been moved by Commissioner James, second by Commissioner Rufo to deny the requested waivers, uh, finding that the nine criteria have not been met. Vote your screens. And the motion carries. Next item. Item nine, docket 017-23 for the property at 1519 Barone Street. The next item is docket 01723 for a property located at 1519 Barone Street in the HUMU Zoning District. This is a request for a variance of rear yard setback. The CZO requires that signage be posted on site at least 15 consecutive days prior to the public hearing. The staff recommends 30-day deferral due to failure to post signage for the required time period. Is the applicant present for BZA docket 017-23? Is there anyone here in support of the applicant? Any opposition? Questions from the board? Motions in order? Yes, proceed. 
Madam Chair, for BCA docket number 017 23, the motions for the 30 day deferral is recommended by staff. Second. With regard to BZA docket 017 23, it's been moved by Commissioner James, second by Commissioner Rufo to defer the matter 30 days. Vote your screens. The motion carries. Next item. Item 10, docket number 018 23. BCA 1823 is a request for a variance from the provisions of Article 21, Section 21.6.T.3 of the Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance to permit mechanical equipment, specifically a generator located in the front yard. The property is developed with a single family residence located near the interior lot line on the Camp Street side of the property. The generator, as proposed, would be located on the Valmont Street side of the property, which is technically the front of the lot, but functions as a property side yard. The subject site is a corner lot. It therefore has a front yard, a corner side yard, an interior side yard, and a rear yard. The placement of the generator is limited to the interior side yard or the rear yard in accordance with Article 21, Section 21.6 of the Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance. Most lots have two interior side yard setbacks and a rear yard. However, a corner lot only has one interior side yard, reducing the locations in which a generator can be placed. The subject property's inherent limitation of mechanical equipment placement is exacerbated by the site's almost complete lack of an interior side yard and a small rear yard. In addition to a small rear yard, the rear yard also contains a shed and at least one rear, rear window, according to photos submitted by the applicant. The subject corner lot only has 27 feet of width. All 27 similarly situated properties surveyed, which were lots, which were other corner lots in the immediate vicinity zoned HURD2, have greater lot widths than the subject lot. Additionally, 89% of the properties surveyed have larger rear yard setbacks than the subject lot, while 60% of the properties surveyed have greater interior side yard setbacks than the subject lot. The interior side yard and rear yard setbacks are permitted locations for ground-based mechanical equipment. These figures indicate that similarly situated properties have more space to accommodate mechanical equipment in the permitted locations and emphasize the peculiarities of the subject lot that are not applicable to other lands or structures in the same zoning district. Based on this report, the SAP believes the requested variance of Article 21, Section 21.6.T.3 meets nine of the nine criteria of the standards for variances of Article 4, Section 4.6.F of the Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance. Therefore, the SAP recommends approval of the requested variance subject to four provisos. Is the applicant present for BCA Docket 018-23? Is there anyone here in support of the applicant for docket 018-23? Anyone here in opposition? Has there been communication with the, uh, the applicant? Yes, and he said he would be here. Any questions from the board? Um, just a brief comment. I think we've seen one very similar to this before. And I think this is one of these structures that is uniquely situated the front door actually more faces the side yard condition as we would define it as opposed to the traditional front yard. So with that type of configuration and also showing how the existing structure also fences off that front yard area, the actual equipment is theoretically screened from the uh, front yard condition. So I think that just helps to further support what the staff is recommending here. Would it be appropriate to proceed with the um, item or should we defer um, to allow the applicant to be here just to ensure that they're okay with the provisos? He did get the report in advance, so I think it would be appropriate to proceed. Mm -hmm. um, if a motion's in order. Yes, proceed. Madam Chair, regards to BZA docket 018-23, my motion is to accept the status for recommendation for the requested waiver of Article 21, Section 21.6 T3 for mechanical equipment location and move for approval uh, with the four provisos, understanding that the nine criteria have been met. And I'd like to add my additional comments for support of this request. Second. Thank you. With regard to the ZA docket 018 23, it's been moved by Commissioner James, second by Commissioner Rufo 
to grant the requested waiver, finding that the nine criteria have been met and subject to four provisos. Motion to screens. The motion carries. Next item. Item 11, docket 019-23. The next item is for a property located at 919 Broadway Street, proposed lot A1. This request is for a variance from the provisions of Article 21, Section 21.6.A.9, accessory structure prior to principal building of the Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance, permit the retention of an accessory structure on a lot prior to construction of the principal building to which it is accessory. In accordance with Article 21, Section 21.6.A.9, no accessory structure is permitted prior to establishing a principal building. The applicant is seeking a variance to retain a garage located at the rear of the subject site with a pending subdivision as the motivator of this request. Finding that the approval standards are met, staff recommends approval of the requested variance subject to one proviso. Is the applicant present for BZA docket 019-23? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Fresia Galvez on behalf of Zach Smith and Zoltan and Design, 530 South Norman C. Francis, New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, I'd like to start off by thanking the BZA staff and Ms. Uh, Bria Dixon specifically. I feel like she typed up a very substantial staff report that addresses our requests very transparently, which we always appreciate. And Thank you again, Ms. Bria. Thank you. Is there anyone else here um, in support of the applicant for BZA docket 019-23? Anyone here in opposition? Any questions from the board? Is there a motion? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you. To the car. I submitted a card. I didn't see, sorry. Okay. Give your name and address for the record. Susan Johnson, 2822 LePage Street. I am not paid to be here. Um, so my question has to do with, there's uh, point number five. Criteria, num criteria number five, will the variance if granted alter the essential character of the locality? I, I was looking at this clause, creating additional multifamily housing will facilitate much needed housing units in the city. So um, who needs housing units in the city? Is it Are we talking about affordable housing here? Or isn't that what's needed? Or are we talking about housing units for Tulane students? Because we need affordable housing. We don't need more units for wealthy college students, which would benefit only the owner, whoever that is. Rabbi Rifkin's um, name is on the survey, both serve revised survey, so I guess his name was on the first one too. I didn't check. But we in the neighborhood, um, I still consider myself of the neighborhood, town of Carrollton Watch, welcome affordable housing here. Amenity Rich, right next to the bus stop on Ferret Street, across the street near the park, near the Willow School. We need, we're hemorrhaging affordable housing. 905 Cherokee is losing four units. That's the next item. We need more working families in our neighborhood. We don't need D to Ds. So that's my, what I think is a substantive, substantial, substantive, objection to this criterion. Thank you. That's the end of your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else here in opposition? If you could come up, please.
Hi, I'm Sally Davis. I reside at 1528 Lower Line Street in Carrollton. This is my neighborhood. Um, I guess one of the things I was curious about is um, when you're approving an accessory structure before the main uh, structure has been approved, how do you know that the main structure will even get approval? And can we know what that is first? So I think that this is a premature decision that's being taken by the Board of Zoning Appeals because we don't know enough about this multifamily building. I know that another thing on this docket coming up is one that used to be an empty lot and they're proposing something that wants to have variances on the front and side and rear yard setbacks. Maybe the next one will be asking that too. How many variances are we going to be asked for in this situation? So my proposal or my suggestion would be why don't we defer this decision until we can see, the public can see, because I really care about my neighborhood, what is being proposed to be put on the empty lot that happens to have a, a structure in the rear of it. That's my comment, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else here in opposition? The applicant has an opportunity to rebut. Zach Smith, Zach Smith Consulting, 530 South Norman C. Francis. I uh, just wanted to say, you know, into the record, there's really nothing to rebut here. This is this is open, shut, uh, nine for nine met. There's obviously some very good extenuating circumstances on this project. Uh, in the staff report, they, they successfully point out that this accessory structure has enjoyed historically being on its own lot of record. Uh, it meets the nine criteria. Uh, you know, I'll probably use a second or two to say that all of these procedural kind of appeals and pushbacks, these are the reasons why we have no housing in the city. These are one of the many tools that people have to fight housing in general. Uh, and for anybody that says they want to be pro affordable housing, they need to be for housing in the first place. And they need to stop wasting your time by coming here to fight everything, especially when we're asking to just not have to tear down an existing garage at a time as continue as future development plans will happen. So I appreciate your time this morning. I know we'll see you guys again today and uh, thank you for your support. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Any questions from the board? Is there a motion? Again, this is just one of those items, just reviewing from what's before us. This is purely about the accessory structure and its historic, historic status on that parcel. So I was digging deeper into what may be provided down the road. That's not what in, that's not what is in front of us, nor is the intended use of what may happen with this property at a later date. So with that, if a motion's in order. Yes, proceed. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, with regards to BZA docket number 019-23, my motion is to accept the staff's recommendation for the requested waive of Article 22, Section 22.6A9 for accessory structures prior to building, principal building, and move for approval with the one noted proviso, understanding that the nine criteria have been met. Second. With regard to BZA docket 019-23. It's been moved by Commissioner James, second by Commissioner Eggins to grant the requested waiver, finding that the nine criteria have been met and subject to one proviso. Vote your screens. The motion carries. Next item. We will now begin with new business for Director of Safety and Ape Permits Decision Appeals. The next item is item 12, BZA docket 02023 for the property at 905 Cherokee Street. All right. Good afternoon. Uh, once again, my name is Nick Kindle, Zoning Administrator with the Department of Safety and Permits. Relative to 90507 Cherokee Street, the applicant's appeal alleges an error in the decision of the Director of the Department of Safety and Permits regarding the issuance of permit number 22-31118 
RNVN, allowing for the conversion of a multifamily dwelling to a two-family dwelling with alleged insufficient off-street parking spaces in accordance with the university area off-street parking overlay district. The subject property is a four unit multifamily dwelling that is being renovated and converted into a two family dwelling. On October 14, 2022, the architect applied for a building permit to renovate the structure and the permit was issued on December 2nd, 2022. The subject property is located in both the university area off street parking overlay district, which I'll refer to as the overlay and the University Area Off-Street Parking Interim Zoning District, which I'll refer to as the IZD. The overlay has been in effect since November 18th, 2021. However, the IZD just went into effect when City Council adopted motion M22449 on October 6, 2022. The applicant submitted a complete permit application on October 14th, 2022. So the permit is subject to the IZD since it was in effect when the complete permit application was submitted. This building permit was reviewed under the IZD requirements, uh, which requires one additional off-street parking space for each new bedroom created. The zoning division found that there was no increase in bedrooms, so no additional off-street parking spaces were required. The appellant states that three additional parking spaces should have been required to go from five bed from a five bedroom structure to an eight bedroom structure. While the appellant ref, uh, references bedrooms and living requirements in city code, what constitutes a bedroom is defined by the ICD. Bedroom shall be defined as an enclosed room that cannot be used for any other purpose, such as a kitchen, bathroom, living room, or laundry room. Any room not explicitly labeled as a kitchen, bathroom, living room, or laundry room shall be counted as a bedroom. According to this definition, the existing structure has 13 bedrooms and the proposed structure uh, had 10 bedrooms. This is a reduction in the number of bedrooms, therefore no additional parking was required by the IZD. Even if some of the rooms are not correctly labeled and if one bedroom should be a living room in each of the three units that do not have a living room, that would reduce the existing bedroom count down to 10. The end result is that the renovation would not result in any increase in the number of bedrooms as the bedroom count would be 10 before and after the renovation. No matter how we look at the number of bedrooms in this permit, there would not be a requirement that additional off-street parking has to be provided. Therefore, the proposed renovation complies with the University Area Off-Street Parking IZD requirement. The department believes that the building permit was approved in accordance with the Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance, and for the reasons stated in this report, the department's decision should be upheld. All right, and that completes my presentation. Thanks. Thank you. The applicant, if you could give your name and address for the record. My name is Deborah Howell. My we need to is, pull the mic up a little bit. It's just hard to hear. My name is Deborah Howell. I live at 1540 Adams Street in Carrollton. Before I begin my five minutes, however, I would just like to show this photograph of the back of the existing house with the two open, note the two open porches downstairs in the rear of the house, which will become significant because safety and permits labeled them bedrooms. 907 Cherokee, I have appealed the permit for 90507 Cherokee because under the new university area off-street parking interim zoning district, the IZD, the project's additional three bedrooms require the addition of three new parking spaces in order to be compliant with the IZD. There remains a great deal of disagreement about the number of existing bedrooms in this fourplex. The definition of bedroom as regards the house and whether the existing dwelling units do or do not meet the CZO's definition of a dwelling unit for zoning purposes. The language of the IZD regarding the need for an additional parking space for every added bedroom has remained consistent since the first IZD was passed on March 5th, 2020. The new IZD reads, bedroom shall be defined as an enclosed room that cannot be used for any other purpose, such as a kitchen, bathroom, living room, or laundry room. Any room not explicitly labeled as a kitchen, bathroom, living room, or laundry room shall be counted as a bedroom. And the only language that changed between the overlay and the new IZD was that dining room was removed from the list of non-bedroom rooms. Despite this very minor change, 
safety and permits has changed the way it counts existing versus proposed bedrooms under the new IZD. They've decided to reinterpret the familiar IZD text, which was intended as a method for counting proposed bedrooms, not existing bedrooms and are retroactively applying bedroom labels to existing rooms to increase the number of existing bedrooms as compared to the developer's proposed bedrooms. This relabeling is being done with disregard for the CZO's definition of dwelling unit, defined as a room or group of rooms providing complete independent living facilities, including permanent provisions for living, sleeping, eating, cooking, and sanitation for one or more persons, and for the municipal codes, bedroom, and living room requirements as spelled out in Article 4, Division 5. The result of safety and permits relabeling of the existing floor plan for 905 Cherokee is that every room in the existing dwelling is numbered as bedrooms except the four rooms the developer had labeled kitchen and the one room labeled living room, and they've come up with 13 existing bedrooms in this house as a result. These 13 so-called bedrooms include two open air porches on both downstairs units that are not habitable space, one not enclosed front entrance living room in the left downstairs unit that has no privacy and is open to the large hall. The hall between that same living room and the kitchen, again, not an enclosed room, and two required living rooms for the upstairs units. Once you subtract the absurdities of counting two open air porches, a hallway, and three required living rooms as bedrooms, you get only seven existing bedrooms, even if you include the two little rear sunrooms upstairs. To residents, neighbors, and dormitory opponents, this existing bedroom relabeling appears capricious, like we're playing a board game. And the outcome is worlds away from the intent and purpose of the university area overlay and IZDs. From the perspective of residents of the Carrollton University area, safety and permits misinterpretations and reinterpretations of the language, intent, and purpose of the overlay and IZD ordinances are so far down a rabbit hole that they come off as mockery of the residents' genuine concerns and fears about the future of this neighborhood, facing a continued onslaught of these high density commercialized developments that are destroying the quality of life in what is supposed to be a residential area. We need help and support from our city agencies, not fights and zoning games. Is that the end of your comments, Ms. Howell? Yes. Is that the end of your comments? Thanks. Is there anyone else here in support of the applicant for BZA docket 020-23? Uh, good afternoon. My name is Keith Hardy. I live at 618 Audubon. Uh, I'm not compensated to be here. The finding that this building had 13 bedrooms is absurd. To reach that decision, they had to count open porches as bedrooms. Who in the city of New Orleans is still sleeping on open porches? They did a lot of other things too, but I can't get into those because of time constraints. Uh, it's absurd to apply the labeling requirement to existing plans instead of to propose plans, which is how it's been applied previously. That leads to the staff's conclusion that there were apartments that had no living rooms prior to the purchase of this building. As the stated intent of the IZD is, quote, to require, to require off-street vehicular parking for any increase in the number of bedrooms, it should be interpreted restrictively as a minimum requirement to require parking spaces rather than to let the project go forward without requiring parking spaces. A recent addition to the comprehensive zoning ordinance makes it clear that on zoning appeals, the quote, board shall owe no deference, no deference to interpretations by the director of safety and permits. Uh, the law is also clear that when an interpretation leads to absurd results, such as people sleeping on porches, you, it, it's, it can't, that can't be the law. That's very clear. This has been said in numerous legal decisions. Uh, I therefore ask that you uphold this appeal, that you not support this ridiculous decision that there were 13 bedrooms in this property uh, today. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else here in support of the applicant for BZA docket? All 
Hi, it's Sally Davis again, and I live at 1528 Lower Line, but my family has owned 901 Cherokee immediately next door to this project since 1968 and continue to own that house. The bedroom upstairs where I lived was directly opposite 905 and a half, where they're claiming an absurd number of bedrooms. And I know that space and I know the downstairs spaces. Let me just state, this is my personal knowledge. Down at the bottom, 905 and 907, the first room as you walk in the front door has always been a living room. It, I have seen it. I know the people. We would be friends with them. A single man lived on 905. Then after that, another single man, another woman lived there. And she said, although it was advertised as a two bedroom, she didn't know why anybody would call that small room a bedroom. And she lived in the one bedroom that was a bedroom. Upstairs on the side closest to me, 905 and a half, there were two bedrooms because it had an outside staircase that didn't take up additional inside space. On the ins out on the upper 907 and a half, that had a single bedroom because you had to have a staircase on the inside of the building. And that's why we were referring to a hallway that was being counted as bedroom. It's not a bedroom. It has no closet. It has no close off ability. If I had a daughter, I wouldn't want her in any kind of bedroom like that. Same with the front room. Also, I know from personal experience that this open porch business is absolutely true. I can look through my backyard and see that. There was never, there were never bedrooms there. Now, the building originally, they want to go back to what they call as two family dwelling. It's a misnomer to call what they're proposing a family dwelling because there is no family space. But back before what it was, was your traditional two story living room, dining room, bed, kitchen with um, landing area below, staircase up to three bedrooms and a bath above. If you need examples of what that looks like, look no farther than immediately to the left of 905-907 to the 909-911 building, which is being kept in its traditional manner. We have a lot of students around there. My sister still lives at 901 Cherokee, and we would like to continue living in Carrollton. But the problem and the reason why we fought so hard for this IZD is that when you get over a certain tipping point of, of student rentals of this kind, what you have is a desert whenever you've got spring break, summer, and winter break. There aren't people there walking on the street with their dogs to help keep you safe. It changes the neighborhood in so many ways. This is not a 13 bedroom formerly, and now we're only doing eight. It was originally a six, three and three on top. So if you don't even want to believe the five that is actually the accurate thing of what it's been since 1968, it was already a fourplex then owned by River Lake but you wanna go back to what it was originally, it was three up and three up. That means you're trying to go from six to eight. That means you're adding two more bedrooms. You need two more parking spots. Sorry developers who have want wishes to own a very wealthy property and make a lot of money, but you're trying to do what exactly the IZD is invented to not do. I would That's urge you guys to please not vote yet. I am in complete That's support of this appeal. Thank, Thank you for your time. Susan Johnson, 2822 LePage Street. I am not paid to be here. There were 21 written comments in support of this appeal and one against from the developer. A reading from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 22, verse 39. Love thy neighbor as thyself. This radical message is a commandment. Jesus calls it a commandment. It explains why the BZA is such a hard place to be. BZA is a judicial body, and what's really playing out at the BZA is not just decisions on secular law, the zoning law, but decisions that belong by nature to the moral code, how neighbors live with neighbors. Next, it's often said that the BZA hearings are empty because people are at work, or also that natives, that neighbors are afraid of revenge, a time-honored New Orleans tradition but some neighbors just don't want to fight. They're peaceful people. And like Miss Hayes from docket 016, they tried to love their neighbors. Now the neighbor who lives next door to this house at 905 Cherokee is, is like that. She's not here today, 
even though she is now surrounded on three sides by D to D's private dorms currently under construction across the street, 837 Cherokee, behind her house, 7417 Butte, and next door now at 905 Cherokee. Ongoing construction on three sides. I grew up around the corner. I've known this neighbor and her sister, the co-owner, since we were children. They are my sisters. This family believes in peace. They've been good neighbors to the rental tenants next door for 50 years. There was never there were never as many as eight tenants there. City Hall can slice it and dice the laws however they like, but this neighbor knows and what's left of the neighborhood knows from all the years of living here that there were never eight bedrooms. It's a fiction. Finally, checking the MLS, here are the rents. 1350, 1350, 1045, 945, that's four units, 3,600 square feet, what the realtor erroneously calls four two-bedroom apartments. The neighborhood disputes that configuration. This house was in inhabited by working people for whom this is affordable housing and it's not now being lost. Five bedrooms, six bedrooms in the past, five bedrooms most recently. The new re rent as stated on the print summary is $1,500. Is that rent per unit or per bedroom? We don't know, but we can make a good guess. The owner is not running a charity. This permit is in violation of the amended university area IZD. Please uphold Ms. Howell's appeal. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else here in support of the applicant for BZA docket 020-23? My name is Kelly April. I live across the street at 916, 918 Cherokee. I've lived there since 1999. My brother owned it before me. I have no problem turning this back into a double, except this thing has never, ever had 13 bedrooms. I've been inside it. I've known tenants over the years that have lived there. It never had 13 bedrooms. That's crazy. There's a porch upstairs and downstairs. I've been over there for parties. I have no problem with students. I grew up in the university area. I don't have an issue with students. I have an issue with eight cars and no parking. I have all street parking routinely. I have students that live around me block my driveway. <laughs> Trying to get a car towed is really fun because it never ever happens. Um, takes so many hours by the time they come tow it, they're gone already. I've missed work because I've had my driveway blocked because there's no parking. That's my only issue. And historically, I can tell you, at least since 1999, there have never been 13 bedrooms in that house. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else here in support of the applicant for BZA docket 020-23? Anyone here in opposition? Hi, my name is Ramesh Reddy. Um, I live at 6037 Perrier Street, New Orleans, Louisiana, 70118. Um, I am the owner of the property along with my parents. We're KSR and Company. I moved here from New York uh, in 2006. Just wanted to state for the record, I am a local. I'm not some out of town big developer who's come in to rip up a neighborhood. I've owned property next to Miss Kelly, who spoke last for several years prior to this one. We've had amicable relationships. Um, I just want to say, from a from a, a macro perspective, you know what's happening in the neighborhood. I understand the ire that's been drawn. Um, I would say that Tulane has provided, um, you know, is, is enrolling a lot of students, right? So students are going to live nearby. Um, I wish there were more housing for them on campus. I guess there's not. Um, my goal here is to say, from a historical standpoint, as well as from a from the ordinances, I believe we're in the right. I pulled up an old, I mean, the, um, the the applicant has pulled up some old MLS listings, pulled one up from 1933. It says 905 Cherokee, half double for four bedrooms at $45. Um, that's public record in the Times Picayune. The historical use was a, a double, both sides. Um, according to the ordinance today, I wrote a lengthy opposition, which hopefully you all have read. Um, but in summation, 
you know, we're not asking for 13 bedrooms. We're not asking for 11 bedrooms. If we're asking for what was pre-existing at least eight bedrooms. Um, and I think that's reasonable given um, the historic use of, 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 of the unit. Thank you so much and hope you have a great day. Thank you. Is there anyone else here in opposition? Good afternoon. Thank you for your time and thank you to the staff for your diligence in preparing the, uh, the rebuttal. Uh, my name is Graham Hill. I reside at 917 Hillary Street. Um, and I'm here uh, both as the architect of record for the project as well as a neighbor um, and, and resident of East Carrollton. I moved to the 900 block of Hillary in 2013 with my wife and my two-year-old son. Since then, we've continued to live and raise our family here um, and have enjoyed building relationships with our neighbors. Um, the project before you today had been reconfigured at some point into a fourplex and operated by River Lake Properties, uh, which was a large uh, developer in the university area that oftentimes left properties neglected. Um, I think it's important for me to share my personal experience and motivation for getting involved in this project. Um, I, for many years, I lived directly across from a fourplex that River Lake owned. They were a string of tenants that were transient, led to a lot of nefarious behavior, which culminated in a homicide that happened right outside my, my door uh, when my kids were sleeping. So I have particularly motivated to take an opportunity to redevelop a property that was mismanaged by this corporation. Um, when my friend Ramesh, who's uh, I know for a long time personally, he's a good person, um, operates with integrity, our kids went to preschool together right around the corner at University of Montessori. Um, and so when he brought this project to me and there was an opportunity to restore a historic two-story double back to its original configuration, as an architect um, and someone who respects historic integrity of structures, I, I said, you know what, this is actually a good opportunity to revive this property and restore it to something that is not, uh, you know, a a slum, essentially, which is what most of River Lakes properties were uh, prior to their liquidation last year. So um, I just want to share that perspective, both as a professional and as a neighbor. This is actually a benefit to the neighborhood. It's an improvement of a blighted property. And uh, in, in my professional opinion, restores the original character of the historic architecture as, as it was intentionally, in, in, intentionally designed original um, uh, in its original configuration. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to remind the audience of our rules of um, absolute prohibition of demonstration. Um, so please refrain from. Is there anyone else here in opposition to the applicant for uh, BZA docket? 020-23. The applicant has an opportunity to rebut. How much time do I have for a rebuttal? It is five minutes. Oh, okay. Well, I, I won't need five minutes. Um, I, I would just like to say that this is this is a complicated situation. Um, I consider myself a preservationist, and normally I would be ecstatic that this house was being returned to its original design. I grew up in a house identical to this on Fern Street. So, but the problem with this house, the problem with this situation, is unfortunately the Department of Safety and Permits. This became complicated because nobody really looks and asks for, nobody at safety permits really is interested in the existing layout of any of these developments. They simply take at face value, whatever they're given by the developer who's making changes. And it puts, I mean, how many times have BZA appeals come up here because the exist the claimed existing uh, layout was just nothing like, and, and number of bedrooms was nothing like reality. It would be nice if we didn't have to keep doing that. If there was a system in place for realistic existing floor plans to be submitted with for projects and realistic proposed floor plans to be submitted for projects. I don't know. I'm not an architect. I'm not a planner. 
I just don't understand why it's so complicated just to have some truth injected into these, these development projects. If Mr. Reddy were converting this back to a double with three bedrooms, two and a half baths, there would be no problem. Instead, like there's no exit from the downstairs um, through into the backyard. There's a bedroom and a bath. There's three bedrooms upstairs and um, two baths. Three, uh, one bedroom downstairs on suite bathroom and a second bath. That layout, that four bedroom, four bath model is pure doubles to dormitories. And that is why people react when any new one comes on the market, no matter how good it is generally for the house. And Mr. Reddy has been caught in the middle of an ongoing battle between the residents of the Carrollton University area and safety and permits who they perceive as not doing their job and not following the ordinances that are duly passed by the city council and not, not examining the records and the documents and the plans that they're being given in, a, in what we consider a normal supervisory fashion. That's all. Thank you. Are there any questions from the board? Just a quick question, uh, Nick, Ashley. Within the, the ordinance as it's been changed over time to identify what's the characteristics, can we just spell out again, what are the characteristics that have to be displayed within a floor plan to demonstrate that it's a bedroom? So the bedroom definition has changed a few times from the initial IZD to the overlay district to the new IZD. Right. Under the current definition, a bedroom is essentially spelled out as an enclosed room that is not a uh, a kitchen, a living room, a bathroom, or a laundry room. So essentially, every other enclosed room is counted as a bedroom. I agree. I don't think this house was 13 bedrooms previously. I think even the plan submitted by the architects didn't count 13 bedrooms, but, but based on the definition of a bedroom, that's how we have to count it. And so we look at what's considered a bedroom prior to the renovation, what meets the definition to a bedroom after the renovation, and we look at the difference there. And so there's rooms both before the renovation and after the renovation that aren't going to be used as bedrooms, you know, dining rooms ended up getting counted. Uh, I don't think the dining room is even going to be used as a bedroom based on its location. It's essentially smack dab in the middle of the, of the unit, but we have to count it as a, as a bedroom. So, so I think the issue that we come across is oftentimes people want to Kind of look at what was actually used as a bedroom prior and look at you know what meets the icd definition afterwards and then do that math but you know we have to apply the law equally before and after the renovation okay i appreciate that nick and the honesty to it because i do i concur when you look at how this is laid out we would all everybody in this room looking at this plan would interpret it one way and understand how it may have historically been used but unfortunately, the nature of the legislation and how this is regulated precludes us from looking at it objectively in terms of how it may have historically been used. And, and a chairwoman has already stated, please, no outbursts. And here's the thing. We're actually all on the same page. Ma'am, 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 you out of order. We're all on the same page. We actually concur. Here's the reality. We have to strictly interpret this based off of what's in front of us right now. I agree that this is not 100% correct. The venue for you to look at this, go back to the council person and ask them to modify the ordinance so more rules are put in place to help to objectively look at this, understanding the historic nature of how properties have been used. That's the venue right now because he's stuck and she is stuck interpreting is based off of the letter of the law and all we can really do as board members is review it in accordance with that same law i don't like the outcome but i have to, but sometimes we have to make rulings as board members up here even when we don't concur what the actual outcome is at the time now if even if we did take into account the two back porch components that's in the back of the building that still only brings us down to 11. 11 is more than the eight is proposed correct so in that, in that case, 
we're still not there. So I'm not really, I get it. I understand the level of frustration. We're just as frustrated because we have to see it here, but we are responsible to review this in a certain level of accordance and understand what's spelled out within it with the loan law. Any other questions from board members? I was gonna bring up the same point um, and just kind of add to it that when we've had these come up before, the reason that some of these definitions have been worked and reworked is because I believe last month when this came up, there were questions that some things that weren't classified as bedrooms should have been classified as bedrooms. Mm -hmm. So we're constantly going through this back and forth where one time you may want it to read one way, one time you may want it to read another way. But the, the purpose and the point at the end of the day is that what the use may be is not how you're looking at the definition of a bedroom. You're looking at it squarely based on how it's read in the ordinance. And that's the most transparent and objective way to do it considering the circumstances. Are there any other questions from board members? Is there a motion? If a motion's in order. Yes, proceed. Madam Chair, with regards to BZA docket number 020-23, my motion is to uphold the decision of the Director of Safety and Permits. Um, and that's it. Second. With regards to BZA docket 020-23, it's been moved by Commissioner James, second by Commissioner Rufo to uh, uphold the decision of the Director of the Department of Safety and Permits, finding that there's not an error in that decision. Vote your machines, your screens. Oh, Motion carries. Next item. Item 13, BZA docket 021-23 for the property at 7700 through 7702 Birth Street was removed from the agenda as this appeal is not proper before the Board of Zoning Adjustments. Item 14, docket, docket number 022-23, 309 through 311 Decatur Street. Good afternoon, board. Ashley Becknell, Chief Zoning Official. Relative to 309 through 11 Decatur Street, the applicant's appeal alleges an error in the issuance of 22 ABOP-14934, the approval of occupational license number 2214885, and any and other any and all other pending applications on 309 Decatur Street, New Orleans, Louisiana. While the appellant's letter brings up a number of matters which are not properly before this board, such as his dissatisfaction with the responses provided to his public records requests, we believe that his complaint stems from a single zoning decision that informed the approval of the cited ABO and occupational licenses. I would take a brief pause here from my written statement to remind the board that this statement was submitted a week before the meeting and was submitted before we received and reviewed uh, Mr. Smith's, Mr. Schmidt's letter from February 27th, 2023. So just for clarity, I wanted to point that out. Um, so to continue with my prepared statement, an application for a live entertainment license, 22LVEN-14943 has been filed but not approved and therefore is not yet ripe for appeal. First, the department would like to point to the BZA administrative rules, policies and procedures at section 2B. That section reads in pertinent part, this application form shall be accompanied by the data required in such form so as to supply all of the information necessary for a clear understanding and intelligent action of the board. The department does not believe that this standard was met in this case. While the letter references what the appellant believes to be a terminated conditional use, he does not provide any information as to why he believes that this conditional use has terminated. As such, the department questions whether this is a complete application. Nevertheless, we present our reasoning behind the issuance of the cited licenses out of an abundance of caution and to provide the board with all relevant information on this matter. In 2000, a conditional use ordinance was passed by the City Council pertaining to 309 Decatur Street, permitting a nightclub on the premises. A copy of that ordinance is attached to our materials. In 2004, a subsequent conditional use amendment was passed to expand the existing nightclub to the second floor excuse me, <clears throat> to the second floor. A copy of that conditional use is also attached to our materials. 
while the applicant was required to record a final site plan approved by the city planning commission as part of these ordinances the department and license applicant were only able to locate recorded plans for the 2004 conditional use which show the first floor as out of scope copies of these plans as well as plans from a subsequent 2016 permit are also attached to our materials after consultation with the law department, it was determined by the Department of Safety and Permits that in the absence of proof that the 2000 ordinance was not valid, even without being able to locate plans and in light of the perfected subsequent conditional use amendment that references this 2000 ordinance, the department should presume the law is valid. Therefore, we presume that there is a valid conditional use on this property for a nightclub. A nightclub is no longer a defined use in the CZO. However, its closest equivalent is bar. And the definitions relevant to that are provided in the footnotes of our written statement. According to the CZO's transition rules, all conditional uses and variants granted prior to the effective date of this ordinance or any subsequent amendment to this ordinance remain in full force and effect unless a conditional use is allowed as a permitted use as of the effective date of this ordinance. The recipient of the conditional use or variance may proceed to develop the property in accordance with the approved plans, including all conditions included as part of the approval. If the recipient has failed to act on the conditional use or variance before the approval expires, including any periods of extension granted, the provisions of this ordinance govern, CZO 1.5.G. Therefore, the department determined that there is a conditional use on this property permitting a bar. Under the current CZO, a bar is a conditional use in the VCE1 district where the property is located. Given that a conditional use is required, and that the department determined that a conditional use had been, been obtained and amendments to that conditional use had been filed and that all other conditions and requirements were met, the department approved the occupational license and ABO license for this property as a bar. Because of this, we ask that this decision be upheld by this board. And this is Director Jackson joining us as well, who may have statements to make. Was that the end of your comments, Ms. Becknell? Yes, that is the end of my comments. The applicant. May, just a request, since the um, submissions that were submitted for this appeal um, spoke specifically. I object. To, decision that I, made. I, I object to this. Mr. Can Rivers is not authorized. He's, he's not, he shouldn't be speaking right now. Um, he, he is a representative of the city. So he's not a direct, he's not a representative of the Department of Safety and Permits. He's a, he's, he's the executive director of the state, the city planning commission. Mr. He is not a, he is not, this is an appeal of director of safety and permits. It's not a city planning commission uh, uh, issue. He is, he, he, he can speak as he goes sign a card, but he can't sit at this table like this and, and speak. What is it? Are you objecting to him? I'm objecting. Here? Yeah, well, I object to him in general, but I'm certainly objecting to him being a part of this conversation as at the table. He is not a member of the Department of Safety and Permits. This is a Department of Safety and Permits. Please show me in your BZA regulations where he gets to sit there and talk. Well, the, the BZA is um, a board that falls under the City Planning Commission. So um, I believe it would be appropriate. Not when it's acting and, and, and under appeals no, as, as, a, as, a, as a quasi judicial board. Mr. No, it isn't. I haven't even heard Madam Chairman. the points that um, Mr. Rivers is even presenting. So I can't even say if it's, I, I'm, I'm not, I, I can't. I'm saying for the record, I'm objecting and it's improper. That's for the record. I mean, we, we, we know where it's this is going. Important. I'm just putting it's that for the record. For you Thank to you. make objections, but could you go so ahead? Mr. Mr. Schmidt will have ample time to object to what I'm about to say, but at least I should be afforded the opportunity to say it. Absolutely. Before he objects. My request is to be able to respond to the number of accusations that have been made by Mr. Schmidt in the uh, submissions that he made, particularly with respect to what is under his argument, a real central part of this appeal, which is a decision that I made um, as executive director to sign off on development plans for a 2000 con conditional use. If the board wants, I can certainly get up and do it as a card. Um, it, I, I will be saying um, a response, and you can see why from the response that I just got from uh, Mr. Schmidt, uh, but I do think that there are some legal issues that are pertinent to um, my role in this um, and would offer uh, a request to let me speak. 
Um, I mean, in so much as the comments would relate to anything related to your um, to your decisions, um, I I don't see that there's a difference in where the response comes from if you're sitting there versus if you're sitting at the um, the podium. Um, as long as your comments are just related to um, anything that's directly directed to you in terms of your decision. They are. Thank you. Mr. Schmidt, you can go ahead with your comments. No, I think Mr. Rivers wanted to speak. I just, wanted to speak or you here. would just- I would love to speak. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. So uh, Mr. Schmidt's appeal calls into a question, a decision is sure to issue several permits related to a business at 309 Decatur Street. Specifically, he asserts that the issuance of the permits was improper without first completing a formal amendment to the conditional use permit that currently encumbers the property. So the appeal is presumably submitted pursuant to CZO uh, Article 4.8.B3 of the CZO, which provides for appeal decisions made by the Director of the Department of Safety and Permits on permits issued under the CZO. And I typically do not have a role in zoning appeals other than accepting the application and performing completeness review, but I'm responding to this because it, it directly implicates and I assume seeks to overturn my actions. Specifically, much of the appeal centers around my decision, uh, a decision made by me and my role as executive director of the City Planning Commission to sign off on development plans submitted in support of a 2000 conditional use ordinance. On a procedural note, the extent to which the appeal seeks to invalidate my decision to sign off on development plans, I would argue that the appeal is, the appeal is improper. Zoning appeals are made to the BZA, made to the BZA are explicitly limited to decisions made by the director of the Department of Safety and Permits. Decisions to the executive director uh, on development plans, however, are made to the City Planning Commission under a number of sections in the city in the CZO, including section 4.5.8, which specifically states appeals to the City Planning Commission may be filed concerning the decision of the executive director of the City Planning Commission on any decision relative to a development plan and design review. Emphasis added um, that it is to the City Planning Commission and not the Board of Zoning Adjustments. Articles or sections 4.5.D and 2.5.F restate this appeal path. Um, there's some confusing language in section 4.8.D, but to my point, there is no language in the CZO that explicitly authorizes any appeal of my decisions to the BZA. Moreover, to the extent that this appeal involves actions taken pursuant to provisions of the old CZO, the appeal provisions of the old CZO are similar. Under section 16.9.9 .9 of the old CZO, appeals of the decisions made by the executive director of the CPC in connection with the conditional use and development plans shall be made to the City Planning Commission. Now, as to the substance of the appeal, Mr. Schmidt argues that my sign off of development plans related to 2000 conditional use was improper. And I'm going to quote his. Uh, statement from these February 27th, 2023. Both the former zoning ordinance and the current zoning ordinance require that final development, final plans in, approved in conjunction with a conditional use permit must be recorded, emphasized, in the Orleans Parish Conveyance Office within three years of the final passage of the conditional use ordinance. Failure to record plans within the prescribed time renders the conditional use permit null and void. In this case, and this is emphasized, Rivers signed off on 2000 plans to be recorded in 2023, some, 2020, some 22 years after the final ordinance was adopted by the city council. There is obviously no excuse for this action and Mr. Rivers knows it. And again, this is a quote from a letter submitted by Mr. Schmidt to you all dated February 27th of this year. So, Unfortunately, Mr. Schmidt undermines his argument uh, by grossly misstating the substance of the law. Putting aside the fact that he's simultaneously arguing that the conditional use, conditional use is null and void and that it also is still effective and should be amended, the reality is that the former CZO and the current CZO are significantly different on this particular issue. It is true that under the current CZO, failure to record approved final development plans within three years automatically nullifies a conditional use approval. However, under the former CZO, the CZO under which my decision to make, to sign off on these documents was based, there is no such time limitation. 
Section 16.6.2 of the old CZO specifically provides the executive director or his agent shall verify that the plan incorporates all conditions set forth in the ordinance authorizing the conditional use and shall sign the plan to indicate the approval. The applicant shall have signed the site plan according to the conveyance office of Orleans Parish not later than 30 days following the date of an approval. No three years, no requirement to do it within three years. Section 16.9.11 of the former Z CZO did provide a process for the termination of a conditional use permit after three years, but it doesn't apply to this matter. First, it only applies to permits for the development of vacant land for which substantial construction did not begin after three years. Second, it did not provide for an automatic termination as suggested by Mr. Schmidt. Instead, it provides for a process whereby the council could authorize the CPC to hold hearings and make recommendations to the council on whether an approval should be terminated or extended. The city council would then need to make a decision on whether or not to rescind the approval. No such rescission was made in connection with this matter. Likewise, there's no language in either the 2000 conditional use ordinance or the 2004 conditional use amendment that establishes any time limitation on the final development plan approval. Accordingly, since there was no provision automatically terminating the conditional use approval, that approval remains intact pursuant to the decision made by the director of the State Department of Safety and Permits. Similarly, since there was no time limitation on the final development plan approval, there was nothing improper about my signing off on development plans that complied with the conditional use approval, even though the sign off was 22 years after the original approval by the city council. Finally, I would be remiss without commenting again before this board on the unnecessary and unprofessional personal attacks made by Mr. Schmidt directed at me, at Ms. Jackson, and at my staff, at our respective staffs who have assisted in this matter. While he certainly allowed and expected to zealously represent his clients, his continued insistence on elevating legitimate disagreements about legal nuances of complicated zoning matters to personal attacks on dedicated city employees goes beyond zealous representation. The unfounded and unsupported accusation of incompetence, conspiracy, and criminality are slanderous and have no place in a zoning appeal. And just to be clear, Mr. Schmidt is accusing me of criminal activity for failing to comply with a law that does not exist. Okay. Now I can address Mr. Schmidt's attacks in an appropriate form if necessary, and I'm not suggesting that the board weigh his attacks in considering the merits of this appeal. As stated before, I believe the, that the lack of merit stands out on its own. However, I do have a responsibility as the executive director of the city planning commission to protect my staff from hostile work environment that such attacks create. And so I urge you to use your platform as a board to ensure that the proceedings before you are conducted in a professional manner and remain focused on the legal questions at issue. Available if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. You can go ahead, Mr. Schmidt, with your comments. Okay, um, first, some housekeeping. Um, I want to make sure for the record that. Make sure you're talking into the mic. I can't hear. I want to make sure for the record that my full 229 pages were received and put into the record, the exhibits. They weren't in the meeting packet. That's why I have a problem with this. You've got a you've got a 503 page meeting packet that doesn't have my 229 pages in it. So I think that's a problem in and of itself. We have two files. So there is a file that has uh, 290 pages in it. That okay, starts with but your it, letter. Okay, well. I just it's not labeled meeting packet. I just want to make sure that it's we have we have documents from you along with exhibits. OK, yeah, it's not it's not on in a llama system. If you do, that's correct. But there's only one meeting packet on the llama system, and it's the 503 pages. So I think just so how we like it labeled as the meeting packet. So when we go to appeal, there's an official record that includes my 220. So pages. Just to kind of help out with this one real quick. It's in how every packet has been provided to us. There's two files, including which you have provided, and that's what's been communicated to the board. So I'm acknowledging this is received from our standpoint. Perfect. Uh, second of all, I would like to, uh, I'm going to ask for a deferral of this matter um, on 
we, we started looking for public records on this case back in November of 2022. Um, we finally got emails from the various parties that we were looking for on February 28th, 2022. That was last week. That was the day after this request was, um, I mean, the, the submittal deadline for supplemental material had passed. Ms. Becknell phoned me on Friday the 24th, I guess that was, and asked me if I wanted to defer it. And I said, no, because at that point we were still hoping to get from the city attorney's record, uh, city attorney's office, those records. But we feel that the emails are important for this appeal um, and certainly need to become part of the record for the appeal that we no doubt will have to take to civil district court. So uh, we are asking for an appeal here uh, because um, the documents that we've submitted do show that, and Ms. Becknell has acknowledged that we did not get those documents um, timely enough to uh, appear. I would um, like to clarify briefly that I do we, not have any knowledge. I, I want to, the so Ashley, left. Ashley, uh, just for the sake of decorum, let him finish his comments. We'll come back to you on that. Sorry about that. All right. Um, with that said, um, and discounting what Mr. River said because his, uh, his comments again are out of place. The interpretation of what the former CZO says is not what Mr. River says, it's what, what the law says and what the black letter law says and what y'all interpret it as. He can say that there's not a three year limit, but everybody knows that you cannot go back 22 years later and, and, and all of a sudden file, you know, uh, file report uh, uh, plans to revive a conditional use. This is typically what happened. Safety and permits screwed up on this. This was, was issued permits for, you know, that they started letting them uh, renovation permits for a bar. We started in June of 2002 questioning the city on this. There are letters in my record, August 22nd, October 14th, September, November, all along throughout this process. Shots, advertised that this bar was going to open up in July of 2022. Why did it not open up in July 22? Because Mr. Rivers couldn't find the records in the, in the conveyance office. So what did they do? They knew they weren't there. So how did they, have to, they had to figure out it took them from July to uh, January, middle of January, to figure out how they were going to turn around and say it was this. Ms. Becknell's uh, memo says, and this is this is beautiful, it, it must be presumed that the, uh, the department should presume the law is valid. Where in the BZA does it, where in the provisions of the CZO does it say there's a presumption that the law is valid? The law requires that the plans be recorded. It was not recorded. The 2000 conditional use failed. The 2004 conditional use for an expansion, and I, I, I direct you to to um, the uh, exhibit 15, or excuse me, uh, zoning docket, um, uh, or, or it's in several places. Uh, CPC, uh, the transmittal letter on 8204, uh, uh, transmission letter from City Planning Commission to Council. At that time, it was Yolanda Rodriguez. Um, it's in your meeting packet at 2030 of uh, 503 says, you know. This is an expand expanding the existing supper club to the second floor. Further, if you look at exhibit 15 in my records, page 202 to 212, specifically 208, safety and permits stamp on the top left of that sheet shows that that the first floor of this restaurant that the, they submitted, uh, uh, the first floor was was filled with four tops. As, and the second floor was filled with four tops and, and other rooms. This was a restaurant by the applicant that submitted plans back there in that, that are at exhibit 15 um, and that are, were stamped and approved by the Department of Safety and Permits as a restaurant. This was not a bar. The last use was not a bar. It was a restaurant. So yes, even though they, you know, if you didn't have the 2000, um, conditional use failed. They're back to an expansion of a supper club onto the second floor, which was granted. That was re recorded. Those plans were recorded, which left the 2004 supper club in place. That's what's there. The ordinance um, 
1999-75 that was adopted by the city council on December 15, 2000, was returned signed by the mayor December 18, 2000. The three-year clock began to then run on December 19, 2000, and those 2004 plans weren't recorded until October 26, 2004, and then again under Mr. Um, Rivers' purview in January of 2023, at which they finally, seven months later after, you know, or, or eight months later after applying for this, opened the door with a restaurant permit. That's as simple as it gets. It's all in front of you. Uh, my letter states for the exhibits, but the bottom line is, contrary to what Mr. Rivers just said improperly at this table. All right, Mr. Mr. Schmidt, that's the end of your time. Well, I've, I've got time from, I think someone ceded time to me. You hadn't indicated that at the beginning of your remarks, right. so well, I don't know. Is she should Jessica Dietz? Yeah, Jessica Dietz. Um, I am. I am. I mean, I, no, I, I've actually wrapped up. But again, we're looking for because of the public records. You know, this is not a matter that just slipped here. We were looking at this, and my records show, and even the city's records show, we were on this in June of 2022. We knew what was going on. We saw it happening. We saw it developing. And that's what happened. And exactly what we thought was going to happen happened. And there we are today. So thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else here in support of the applicant for BZA docket 022-23? Anyone here in opposition? Good afternoon. My name is Allie Conley. I'm at 909 Porges. I'm here to speak in uh, opposition of the appeal in favor of the issuance of the permit and the occupational license with the operation of the nightclub. Um, first, it hasn't been stated, and I just want to emphasize what we're dealing with here is a responsible business owner who already operates two successful businesses in Orlando and Miami with no concerns or issues as it relates to occupational licenses or permits. Um, I do want to note that this property, as was stated by Director Rivers, and um, this property is properly, properly zoned, excuse me, for a nightclub and a bar. I wanted to highlight the timeline, which has been spoken to, um, but as has been stated in 2000, a conditional use was obtained to operate a nightclub um, since the 2014 CZO, we now call it a bar, but it was obtained as a nightclub. Uh, we do have a copy of that 2000 conditional use ordinance. Um, as I said, the uh, in 2014, it changed to a bar, but in any event, the transitional rules allow for the operation of a nightclub. In 2000, 2001, um, the, uh, the location was operated as a nightclub, Silky O'Sullivan's Irish Pub. Um, for several years, they operated it as a nightclub under that CZO. In Sometime around 2004, um, and the first, what we're dealing with here is the first floor is, is the nightclub, the second floor was for office use and storage. In 2004, the conditional use ordinance was amended to allow for a supper club on the second floor. The first floor was still permitted to operate as a nightclub. Um, in 2012 or 2014, a hookah club was op opened on the second floor. We're not sure when Silky's closed on the first floor. In 2007, the Brennan's family leased the location to operate a fine dining restaurant. They opened briefly, but never closed again. And that brings us to 2002 when Schatz leased the property, applied for a nightclub permit. Um, they complied with everything that the city required of them. That permit was issued and we believe that it was properly issued. We do agree with the decision and we're asking for this board to deny the appeal. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else here in opposition to the applicant for BZA docket 022-23? Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak today. My name is Jason Machado, and I'm one of the owner operators of Shots New Orleans. My partners and I have been operating our Shots venues in over 10 years now in Miami and Orlando. Uh, for years, we've been, dream been dreaming of bringing our consum to the, this historic city. Um, over the past 10 years, we've successfully operated our venues to become staples in our local communities without ever having serious issues with the agencies that oversee our liquor and operating licenses. 
we've managed to navigate our venues through natural disasters like hurricanes, the Zika virus and COVID, uh, keeping our venues operating and our staff employed through very scary, difficult times. On a more personal note, um, my connection to this city goes much deeper than just opening up a venue here. My wife's family has been here for over 40 years. Um, they came to New Orleans escaping the Sandinista government in Nicaragua. My wife and I have spent years visiting the city, engulfing ourselves in the rich culture, the amazing music, the delicious food. Um, it's been a dream of ours to when they put down roots here. And uh, we're lucky enough to have achieved that dream when we finally opened our doors in Decatur Street. My partners and I are very happy and proud to be here. Uh, we look forward to continuing working, working alongside our neighboring venues and being a part of this amazing city. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Ike Spears. I'm here to uh, speak again. Can you pull the mic up a little bit, Mr. Spears? It's just a little hard to hear. Thanks. Okay. Can you hear me better? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Ike Spears. The address is 909 Party Street, 1825. I'm here to speak uh, against the appeal and in favor of the decision of the director. I think we all recognize that the French Quarter is a very special and unique place um, and that we have to do what we can to preserve the unique character, charm, and tout ensemble. Nonetheless, it's a unique place that in certain areas, particularly in v, uh, VCE1, allows for nightclubs and bars. What we have here is an application by a responsible business owner who for many years has operated a responsible uh, operation in both Miami and in Orlando and who's seeking to bring that operation now to New Orleans and to the French Quarter. I would strongly oppose Mr. Smith's uh, attempt to defer this matter um, because I think you have sufficient information to, to make the necessary ruling. I also agree uh, with Mr. Rivers and others that much of what he's talking about is outside the scope of what's intended to be reviewed in this particular hearing. Most importantly, and I've said this at least twice before to this, to this particular BZA board, when you grant him uh, the discretion of a deferral, I think you are encouraging the obnoxious, the rude and unprofessional behavior. This guy talks about uh, hardworking directors and staff members in a way that I would not expect anyone, especially someone who has a law license, uh, to speak. Uh, he violates all sorts of rules of professional conduct and professionalism. So if you grant him a deferral, what you're saying is, uh, Mr. Smith, what you're doing and what you're saying and the way you're doing it is okay with us. And I think we have to at some point let him know that what he does is not okay. Professionals can disagree without being nasty, without uh, being insulting and without personal attacks. That, that's my strong opinion on that. And although he's attacked me, I'm not at issue today. Um, I think that upholding the decision of uh, the director is important. I've said before, we have to change the narrative about New Orleans being a difficult place to do business. We have a responsible business owner who's seeking to open an establishment, hire people and pay taxes. We need to understand that. We need more of that. We need less of people, uh, people walking away in frustration saying it's just too difficult. Uh, on a side note, um, I think Mr. Rivers is right. There is no timeline for the submission of the plans and there is no proof that the plans were never submitted. I can't tell you how many times I've represented people who say I've mailed in checks, nobody finds the checks until months or years later, and we've had original checks, Mr. stapled Spears. applications. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else here uh, in opposition to the applicant for BZA docket 022-23? The applicant has an opportunity to rebut. Uh, just briefly, um, first of all, I reiterate, um, we are asking for a deferral on this matter because we were not given um, emails that were requested back in November 
uh, until after the submission date for the supplemental uh, information. Uh, those emails were finally sent to me by, I had a conversation with um, Tommy Milner in the city attorney's office on Monday. He he was not able to get them out on Monday before the submission deadline at 5 p.m., but he did get them out on the 28th. And so we are going to want to add those to the record. As I said, this will go up there. Um, both the the vendor and Mr. Spear, with respect to both the vendor and Mr. Spears' comment, um, no one is questioning that this is a responsible vendor, and that's not even an issue here. What's at issue here is whether or not the conditional use needed to be amended prior to the issuance of these permits. And that's our claim. We're not saying that they couldn't uh, can operate shots bar there, but they need to go through and properly amend the conditional use per the former CZO requirements. As far as Mr. Spears' claim that, uh, you know, this should be uh, not deferred because you're supposed to spank me and teach me a lesson, you know, th that's that's completely neither here nor there. You know, the deferral is warranted because the city held back documents that I knew were in existence and they were required that they were required to, to, to give me within five days. And it, it, it took them 90 days. Or longer. Those are, are those are important documents in there. You don't you know, I don't I don't get spanked because of that. I also further object and think it should be strict that Mr. Rivers is presence at this table is a problem for the board. This is not about city planning or what I say about Bob Rivers. It's about what's in the appeal. The appeal states what I think was wrong. I suspected what was wrong. There is an email that what, what, what's, what's most important is there's an email that was, was, was apparently uh, given by Miss Jackson that Mr. Rivers made his decision on that I still haven't been produced. I'd like to know that because that's that that email that was back in November, I still didn't get that. So that's why we want to look into this and find out exactly what's there. But when there's a but Mr. Rivers' sign off on this for the for the for the site plan review and the thing says her email of of Tammy Jackson on November. I can't remember um, right here on the synopsis project, a final approval sign off. It's in your file. It says 113022. I don't have that. She didn't make a zoning determination, so it wasn't published as a zoning determination because I printed out the, the list of zoning determinations on the website, and that's not there. So anyway, um, this is not whether or not this is a respectable or, uh, you know, we should open up this and make this a place. I agree with all that, but let's do it by the rules. We have rules. Let's follow the rules. My issue with this board, with this commission, with this department is that with this mayor, we don't follow the rules anymore. We decide we want something done and we just do them. Everybody's got rules. Let's abide by them. Thank you. Are there any questions from the board? Uh, question to Mr. Schmidt. So I'm, I'm channeling some inner calmness. So just to try to help out with this process, there's some documents that you say that you were you have not received at this time. But if we were to grant that you've received them, but I'm just I received them on February 28th. There's that, but then you also mentioned that there was a separate document from Director Jackson that you don't have record. I want to go back. Those that should have been included in a previous submission. I mean, a previous uh, response that one because of the date in which it was done it wasn't in that previous one i have not verified that it was in the supplemental one that i got on the 28th okay that's, and that's, that's what i'm that, that's the main and, and that's actually that's the, the most important one because according to the sheet uh, so without getting too deep yeah. into the detail of i'm asking specifically you're you're saying that there's certain documents that 
you want to look for, you have received some record, but you have not had enough time to go through it to verify. On Tuesday to today, right, that's correct. Okay, that's a, I'm just trying to get to that point. Right. No, I mean, there were about 300 email, you know. Got it. Right. So for the, to avoid belaboring a point. Well, and, 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 and so, I'm sorry. So I, 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 got, got, I got it right now. So just yeah. please work with me. And look, I'm trying to keep this because there's a lot of, there's a lot of tension in a room in terms of how this agenda item is even being heard at this point. So I'm just trying to, I'm trying to stay within the lane right. and make sure that I understand what's there. So there's, sure. I'm asking a series of questions for a reason. Um, understanding that if we were to even grant you a 30 day deferral, would we be in the best position next month to even review it once you've had that time? Are we gonna come back and have more questions, more records requests, or do you feel comfortable that at least if you have what was referred to within a report, that is sufficient enough for us to hear this accordingly? The email that I'm looking for that I just replied was yes. what was was the main document that I'm looking for. Okay. That, 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 wanna... that, that, was, that was the main document that has not been provided, Got or, or at least was not provided timely to be included in this package. Understood. You know, I, so I, I'm, I'm just kind of look. Oh, no. I don't want to look. We we get long winded in a response. Well, no, but I do want to. I, I, think, I, I think you actually you really address my answer, yeah. my question appropriately, just for what I. For but, what I, I but I also want to reiterate because you keep saying if we don't, if we don't, if we don't, there's no jeopardy with. I mean, this this business is operating. Okay. There is no jeopardy with a deferral under the circumstances. It's not like this is a closed business and. If if it wins today, it opens up. If it if it loses today, it closes up. I mean, it's operating. That, that's a fair observation. And, and so, so that, that's what you. I just want to reiterate. Mr. Spears made it sound like this was a big burden for them to have you just, to deal you just with. Just clarify for me. But here's the thing. I'm trying to avoid like the I mean, it's operating, it's selling, it's got it. It's got, got it. you know, it's got guys standing out front with penis syringes. Got it, got it. That's not, it's it's all there. Schmidt. Mr. Schmidt, please not get into the those types of details on the record. I, I was just that's it's in the Thank photographs that are in the record. Got it. Yeah. I, Thank you. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Thank you. There's a request. A request yes, Madam Chair. Deferral. Yeah. Um, in fairness to process and in fairness to what has been requested, understanding the time in which it was brought back. I actually, I as an individual, can't speak for the board, personally don't object to a deferral at this time, understanding that is, you guys concur this business is currently in operation? Question is that? Okay. I don't like blocking commerce through applications and appeals. And you've at least acknowledged that it's already operating, it's there. But if we defer it, it does not harm them in terms of how they operate or the process that's in front of us. So. I don't have an objection to going for a 30 day deferral to give you the time to further structure your argument, further understand. That's just me, sorry. And I'll further acknowledge that um, and generally speaking, taking all of the comments into consideration, but generally we do have a, a courtesy of the initial deferral request right. to grant it. Again, just speaking as one person. Yeah. So unless anybody else have Are there questions, any other I'm questions? ready. Yeah, I could make a deferral. If not, is there a motion? Madam Chair, with regards to BZA docket number 022-23, my motion is for a 30-day deferral at the request of the applicant. Hopefully next month we can get through this. And I, I would ask that we keep the argument focused to what is really the subject matter at hand and let's not get this thing further confused. Second. Thank you. With regard to BZA docket 022-23, it's been moved by Commissioner James, second by Commissioner Rufo to defer the matter 30 days at the request of the applicant. Vote your screens. Motion carries. Next item. The next item is item 15, BZA docket 023-23 for the property at 7417 through 7419 Zimple Street. Relative to 7417-19 Zimple Street, 
The applicant's appeal alleges an error in the decision of the director of the Department of Safety and Permits regarding the issuance of permit number 22-30174-NEWC, allowing for the construction of a two-family dwelling with alleged insufficient lot depth, insufficient interior side yard setback. Nick, Nick hold, tight, hold tight one second. Uh, just a point of concern because I know we had a lot of delay early in a meeting. I know we were going to have a 2 p.m. hard stop because of an obligation that a commissioner has. And my concern is that we start the process. So I'm just clearly because you're up here and you guys have sat here through this. I know you were here for an early item. I just want to at least let you know that out of just respect for your time. Um, I, if you want to just to make it clear that the meeting will have to stop at 2 p.m. Correct. So we could, I, I, wanted, I wanted to at least establish that. Here's the thing. I don't want to also put you in a position that we're rushing to a two o'clock timeline, okay? So I'm giving a, you the option if you wish to just defer the matter until the next meeting, or if not, when two o'clock hits, whether we're finished or not, we're going to have to stop. Yeah, because we, and we're going to lose a quorum at that time. So I want to respect you guys, Tom. Yeah. I don't want to do you wish to proceed? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry. Go ahead, uh, Mr. Kinder. Yeah. And also, if it saves time and you have my report in the record, I'm happy to enter that into the record if it, if I don't need to absolutely read everything. That's there. fine. We can go ahead and proceed because you, you were just going to reiterate what you've written. That's fine. Yes. We can yeah. It's in the record. I'm just literally reading the reports. So. Thank you. You can go ahead, Ms. Howell, with your comments. Okay. Um, my name is Deborah Howell. My address is 1540 Adams Street, and I appear here today as a concerned Carrollton resident and a neighbor. I've appealed the permit for 741719 Zimple because under the University Area Off Street Parking Overlay District, the overlay, this project requires a minimum of six parking spaces, so it currently has a deficit of four required parking spaces. This deficit occurred because safety and permits failed to acknowledge, one, both the intent and purpose of the overlay, which is to limit increases in the number of bedrooms in the district, and two, failed to apply one of the two equal requirements dealing with exemptions that were specified in the overlay section 1830B, paragraphs three and four. Paragraph three specifies a maximum bedroom number requirement that must be met for the unit to qualify for a parking exemption and reads, this off-street parking requirement shall not apply to new construction dwelling units with four or fewer bedrooms or renovations of existing dwelling units where the total number of bedrooms is four or fewer as is determined by the Department of Safety and Permits. In other words, only units with four and fewer bedrooms qualify for relief from the overlays parking requirements. Paragraph four specifies a maximum bathroom number requirement that must be met for the unit to qualify for a parking exemption and reads, this off-street parking requirement shall not apply to any new construction dwelling units where the total number of full bathrooms is less than three per dwelling unit or renovations of existing dwelling units where the total number of full bathrooms is less than three as determined by the Department of Safety and Permits. In other words, only units with 2.5 and fewer bathrooms qualify for relief from the overlays parking requirements. In this project, safety and permits failed to apply both requirements necessary for an exemption by applying the bedroom exemption requirement included in section 1030B paragraph three of the overlay only, but not the parallel bathroom requirement in paragraph four. The staff report reads, under the University Area Off Street Parking Overlay District, one parking space is required for each new bedroom. However, there are a number of exceptions to this parking requirement, such as the off street parking requirement shall not apply to new construction of dwelling units with four or fewer bedrooms. For this project, there are two dwelling units, each of which has four bedrooms. Therefore, this project is exempt from the requirement to provide, provide additional parking. As such, safety and permits incorrectly failed to apply the overlay's very specific requirement regarding the maximum number of bathrooms, 2.5, to qualify for an exemption from the overlay's parking requirements, no matter the number of bedrooms. Nothing in the overlay allows the developers to pick and choose their exemption. Rather, both the bedroom number requirement and the bathroom number requirement must be met for exemptions from the overlay's parking requirements to apply. Any other conclusion leads to absurd consequences. If the BZA supports safety and permits in this misinterpretation that these two exemption statements are independent of each other and that only one of these requirements need to be met for the overlay's exemption from the parking requirements to apply, the consequences of that decision are huge. Under this misinterpretation, developers would be able to submit a proposed plan in which dwelling units had only the requisite 2.5 bathrooms, thus meeting safety and permits mistaken interpretation of, a, of the overlay's exemption requirements, even if they included four, eight, 12 bedrooms per unit. 
Such a result would be both nonsensical and completely antithetical to the intent and purpose of the university area overlay, both university area IZDs and the four years of citizen input and council action that has led to their implementation. So I say again, 741719 Zimple is not compliant with the overlay's parking requirements. It would either need to lose one and a half baths per, per unit or would need to gain four parking spaces in order to become compliant with the parking requirements in the overlay. And I'd also like to add, if I have more seconds, that both units have four bedrooms and four baths. But based on our discussion earlier for 905 Cherokee, where all we heard about was the necessity for strict adherence to the language of the overlay, which is identical to the language in the uh, IZD as far as counting bedrooms. There is a family room labeled here. That is not an allowed room. So by the strict adherence standard of the, the legislation, this is a five, these are two five bedroom units, not with four bathrooms, not two four bedroom units with four bathrooms. That, that's how strict adherence to the language that, that safety and permits claimed for 905 Cherokee must be read for this project as well. Um. Good afternoon, my name is Keith Hardy, um, 618 Audubon. Um, I just wanna go back to a little background that I talked about when I was up here before about the difficulties of this IZD. The process here is it's kind of ping pong. The council member does his best to draft the legislation and he sends it out there and then this board has to figure it out. But this board, has got a lot of leeway and a lot of power. The uh, authorizing legislation 3347.22 says in passing upon appeals where it's hard to carry out the strict letter of the ordinance that you can vary it, the application of the regulations and the provisions so that the spirit of the ordinance is met. That's why it's so important that you look at the purpose and the intent of these ordinances, because when you think something weird that, that you think shouldn't be happening is happening, you need to look at it and try to figure out whether there's a way you can interpret that ordinance. And in this particular case, I want to point out that all of those clauses in this particular ordinance, they're all called requirements. You got 10 quote requirements a requirement is something that's required they the staff says oh we're going to throw out one of them three or four well they can't throw out a requirement um the staff calls four and five it was exemptions and exceptions uh i don't that those words don't appear in the ordinance uh, and so and i think if you if you do want to think about these as exemptions think about it as a partial exemption or a threshold or minimum standards. It's like a homestead exemption. When you get a homestead exemption, that doesn't mean you, you can do anything you want. You don't have to pay any taxes. You're just limited. You're just got an exemption up to a threshold here. They've got an exemption up to a certain threshold here. They didn't meet that threshold on bathrooms. They exceeded it. So therefore, they have to provide all of the, uh, the additional parking spaces that the ordinance requires. Think of it like a tax bracket. If you are $1 over that tax bracket, you're gonna pay the same uh, proportion of taxes that somebody that's at the top of that bracket is. These readings that I'm giving you, these suggestions, they are consistent with the purpose of the overlay, which is, quote, to require off-street vehicular parking for any increase in the number of bedrooms. We've got an increase in the number of bedrooms. You should be requiring off-street parking spaces for those. That's how it should be read. That's the spirit of the ordinance. That's so you need to look at this. Look at, the, if you treat these as requirements and they got to meet all of them, then they've got to provide the parking spaces. Thank, thank you. you. Is there anyone else here in support of the applicant? Uh, 
sorry. I got confused about the language of in support. You need to pull the mic. Yeah, in support of the applicant. Sally Davis again, a 1528 lower line. I apologize for my outburst. I've never been to one of these meetings and I was just astonished about the 13 bedroom thing. However, I would like this board to go ahead and be consistent. So apparently this is a five bedroom on each side development because it has a family room. But I'd also like to comment only because we do have the head of safety and permits here to say, if somebody tells you that something is a bedroom and it's required by the language of the law to be enclosed, would it be so hard to ask the applicant to supply a picture? Because if he had, you would have seen immediately that the 905 thing, there were a hundred, a couple or three rooms that weren't enclosed, but they were being count that you, if you guys felt forced to count we those as bedrooms. Give, we don't want you to address a previous. I know, but I'm, we, I have him here and I never I get just, this access to somebody to, as high up as the head of safety and permits. I want so to he's heard it. That's all. I'm moving item. on to the other one. All right. As for the other one, there's an issue I'd like to bring up, and this has to do with watershed and water wise and the issue of stormwater retention in the neighborhood of Carrollton and across the city, but for right now, this project. This is formerly the Gordon's backyard. That's how I knew it when I was growing up. I knew the people that lived there. Now it's a separate lot and somebody wants to put a house on it. It's gonna have a roof. So we already know that the entire footprint of this building is gonna be, water is not gonna be going into the ground anymore. It's gonna be running into probably gutters um, and down into the, what bit of ground there's left. And I understood that this permit is asking for exceptions to the normal setbacks on the inside side and in the rear, I think in the front too, to the footprint that you're normally allowed, isn't it 20 feet in the back and 15 in the front and three on each side. So if I've got this wrong, please know that I didn't have time as much to read all the documents on this one, just the main ones. What I'd like to say is this, the Department of Safety Permit serves as the city's floodplain administrator. There is an Office of Resilience and Sustainability. There is a city's resilient strategy, resilient NOLA. There is an organization, Waterwise Gulf South, that tries to promote homeowners to do things as much as possible to encourage as much drainage as possible. It's why you guys talked earlier. I'm sorry I'm mentioning another docket, but you talked earlier about permeable parking spaces. Why do you require them to be permeable? It's so that they can absorb water. Otherwise, it's all going down into our drains. And when it does that, we have to actually sometimes turn on extra pumps. When we do that, we increase subsidence, not just of the water you're trying to pump out, but also the water in the general water table of New Orleans. And it increases how much our cities sidewalks and streets are lowering and cracking. So my feeling is this, somebody saw this opportunity to develop something. Why can't they just develop it within the regular setbacks? There is a way as an architect to design a building. I one time built a building in the Bywater on a 26 foot lot. It is possible to design a building that respects the setbacks that we already have. They're asking for a variance. I think you should tell them no, because why should you have a variance when, it, when we have such a problem already with stormwater runoff? And especially when you're not providing the parking spaces that the IZD requires. Thank you very much for your time. And I apologize again for my outburst earlier. Thank you. Is there anyone else here in support of the applicant for BZA docket 023-23? Susan Johnson, 2822 LePage Street. I am not paid to be here. Um, first of all, um, I just want to say that as far as transparency goes, we neighbors would really appreciate knowing when the interpretation of the law changes at safety and permits. Because I have a an email with Jay Dufour about 1015 Adams where I'm saying to him, look, they've got three three bathrooms in this unit under the overlay. It should only be two and a half. And he says, oh, you're right. Okay, that's the way we're interpreting it. I can give you the timestamp if you don't, if you want, but I don't wanna take up your time. The uh, And then from a public records request on A21, A23 Adams, turns out on, um, October 5th, 2022, six months later, that earlier one was March 22. Um, Todd Breckman is telling Preston Tedesco, our interpretation is that um, 
bathroom versus bedroom counter independent of each other. Only one requirement need apply for an exemption. So the interpretation changed within six months. We didn't know about it. How do we know about this? And just like we didn't know about uh, the safety and permit interpretation of the IZD, that the, your new radical interpretation didn't know about it until last month. And in my um, 1117 Pine BZA appeal, and that's one reason why I come keep coming back here with appeals is because I want to know how you guys think and what your procedure is. It's not at all transparent. And I'm going to be at the March 14th event at the AIA Design Center. I hope some of you will be there too. When uh, Tom Mulligan presents his about the, um, the overhaul of uh, ongoing overhaul of s and I, I want to hear about it and I support Mr. Mulligan and I have faith in him. That's what I have to say. Otherwise, as far as water goes, the waters are coming for us, you know. There's only so much time left to develop. The estimate is 2040, maybe 2050. We're not gonna be here forever. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone else here in support of the applicant for BZA docket 023-23? Anyone here in opposition? Good afternoon, Zach Smith, 530 South Norman C. Francis, especially since time is light. I uh, appreciate that basically one, two, and four in the original letter were essentially not talked about today. I'll take that as a sign that everybody has agreed that those have been resolved. Uh, related to the exemption for four or less, the language is extremely clear. The department has defended itself in the written statement. It's consistent with several of these cases that you've heard. Appreciate your time in uh, going against this and opposing and denying this appeal. Thank you. Thank you. Is anyone else here uh, in opposition? Good afternoon. My name is Christopher Johnson. Can you hear me okay with the no, microphone? No, pull up, A little pull up closer. The All right. Good afternoon. My name is Christopher Johnson. I'm here to speak on behalf of the uh, property owner on the architect of record. I'll be quick on our time. Thank you for um, the staff recommendation to uphold the permit as a viable permit. We believe we've done our due diligence as a clarification point. Enclosed rooms we recognize were brought up here a little bit earlier and rooms that cannot be used for any other purpose. We see that on this floor plan, kitchens and great rooms are all one room. This is not a bedroom. This is not a fifth bedroom. To be clear, we agree with the staff's recommendation to uphold the permit. Thank you for your time. Is there anyone else here in uh, opposition to the applicant for BZA docket 023-23? The applicant has an opportunity to rebut. I'll be quick. Um, I, I'd like to say that I agree with the architect that the family room is not a bedroom, but then that's it's not our right to determine apparently uh, because it doesn't uh, adhere to the strict interpretation of the legislation and we have no choice really compare that to call that a bedroom um on 905 uh cherokee many unenclosed rooms were still labeled bedrooms a back porch open back porch was labeled a bedroom my point being why are some projects subject to the strict adherence rule to the, of the legislation and it's usually on the existing bedrooms, of course, and others aren't. It's an inconsistency, it's capricious, and it drives the neighbors crazy, basically. That's all. Are there any questions from the board? Uh, just a question, um, I guess the million dollar question, Mr. Kendall, in terms of the, um, the great room, uh, if you can just address the clarification or explain 
how that room is classified and whether or not it's classified as a bedroom. Uh, correct. And sorry, I don't have the plans here in front of me, but my recollection is that, yeah, like it was a kitchen, family room, dining room, all one kind of open space. So that would be considered part of the kitchen, whether or not it was formally labeled as that, because it's not a separate enclosed space as we get into the definition of a bedroom being a separate enclosed space. And you know, getting back to what's considered an enclosed space, like I think in the past case, there's certainly things that are maybe partially enclosed where you've got maybe a double door between. I don't know if that's considered fully enclosed versus partially enclosed. Either way, I don't think it made a difference in the last case because, you know, it counts both ways. And, you know, if whatever was open was also part of the open dining room. So I, yeah, uh, I think in this particular case, it's very clearly one big open space that's kind of used as a common great room. Just to clarify the definition of, just come back, what's the definition of a uh, bedroom? Uh, so this definition is probably slightly different from the IZD definition, but a bedroom shall be defined as an enclosed room that cannot be used for any other purpose, such as a kitchen, bathroom, dining room, living room, or laundry room. Any room not explicitly labeled as a kitchen, bathroom, dining room, living room, or laundry room shall be counted as a bedroom. Correct. So you just, you actually just hit one key fact. This is one separately enclosed room and it has a kitchen function within it, correct? Correct. So it cannot be deemed a bedroom. Correct. Thank you. And you kind of hit on the second question I was going to ask in terms of the distinction between the IZD and the overlay district, that there was a slight difference in the um, the definition terms. Correct. And that the IZD does not apply in this situation because of the timing of when the application was, uh, the permit application was submitted. That is correct. This permit application was submitted prior to the IZD being in effect. Okay. Any other questions? Sorry, any other questions from the board? For motions in order. Yes, proceed. Madam Chair, with regards to BZA docket 023-23, my motion is uphold the decision of the director of safety and permits for this uh, appeal. Second. Thank you. With regards to BZA docket 023-23, it's been moved by Commissioner James second by Commissioner Rufo to uphold the direct, uphold the decision of the director of the Department of Safety and Permits. Vote your screens and the motion carries. Next item. Would the board consider a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. Second that. It's been moved by Commissioner James, second by Commissioner Rufo to adjourn. Um, vote your screens. The motion carries. Our meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone, for your patience today. <laughs>